live. We're live, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Just wait. Verbal. We're live, Mr. Oh, Chairman. We don't get the normals. No, I'm American no. lady. Tell I'm afraid the not. No, not this time. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome to the meeting of the Planning and Regulatory Committee. The agenda papers and other relevant information for this meeting are available for public viewing on the Herefordshire Council website. Please remember that your words and actions should be chosen carefully. And members are reminded that speeches are limited to three minutes. The Council is streaming this meeting live on the Herefordshire Council YouTube channel and also making a recording. The recording will be available via the Council's website shortly after the meeting has concluded. Other attendees are, uh, are permitted to film, uh, photograph and record the meeting, provided it does not disrupt the business of the meeting. If you, wish to be if you do not wish to be filmed or photographed, please identify yourself so that anyone who attempts to record the meeting can be aware. To ensure that the recording is quality is maintained, could members speak as clearly as possible and keep background noise to a minimum and sure, ensure that all mobile phones are turned and or turned silent? Welcome to those in attendance. I will now ask Mr. Bean, Mr. Bishop to introduce the officers for this meeting. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, members. Kevin Bishop, Lead Development Manager of Planning Services. Um, we have three items on the agenda today. Item number six, Landmore in South of Grafton, Lane, Hereford, will be presented by Heather Carlisle to my right. Um, also, um, item number seven, land southwest of, of the Roman Bayer, Herefordshire. Uh, Elsie Morgan will present that, um, stood in the doorway there. We'll present that later on. Uh, and item number eight, land adjacent to Arrow, Arrow Lee, and Le um, will be presented by Andrew Banks, who will join us later. Also joining us online is the legal advisor, Kerry Munro. Thank you, Chairman. Katie Jones. Oh, and the highways officer, Katie Jones. Thank you. Thank you. Item one, apologies for absence. We have received apologies from Councillor Hardwick. Are there any other apologies? None, I think. I think <coughs> oh, Councillor Johnson. Name substitute, substitutes. We have the following substitutes. Councillor Summers for Councillor Hardwick. Are there any other substitutes? If there are none. Declarations of interest. Please indicate if you wish to declare an interest, an interest and then we will call each councillor in turn. Councillor Milne. Uh, in respect of agenda item seven, I am acquainted personally with the applicant and with uh, one of the objectors for whom we will be hearing in a minute, although I Want to stress that I have not been in communication with either in respect of this application. Are there any other declarations of interest? Right. Item four minutes of the meeting to confirm the minutes of the meeting held on the 31st of August 2022. <clears throat> no matters of accuracy have been notified to the monitoring office. Are the minute, minutes of the meeting? Oh, sorry. Chairman, um, with regards to the uh, declared pecuniary interest, that would mean that the member could not participate in the item. No. The, the connection, and um, my advice would be that they are to be um, to leave the meeting when that discussion is being conducted, and it presents uh, advice. Uh, uh, so to reference to me, I do not have a special one interest. No, no. it's just an he's just no. I mean, I, I think we would have difficulty in in a county like Herefordshire of, <laughs> of, of actually dealing with any planning applications that we were divided by being known. But we know the applicant. I think she misheard. She said pecuniary, so yeah. I think she misheard. Yeah, yeah. personally, I said personally acquainted. Yeah, not pecuniary. Personally acquainted, that, does that mean that he knows the applicant? I do know the applicant, yes. I have not corresponded with the applicant or the objector in any way in respect of this application, however. My acquaintanceship with them both goes back to a different application five years ago. What I would say is that um, members need to be mindful of how that appears to the public when decisions are being made. 
and the um, appearance of bias should be taken into accord. The meeting will still be quiet, um, should that member not be able to participate in the voting. All right. Okay, but now we'll move on to. I need to be advised as to whether I'm allowed to participate or anything. I, 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 I would have assumed that it, the acknowledgement of my acquaintanceship needs to be, get down the minutes, but it just shouldn't affect my participation. Is it a non is it a non pecuniary? Yeah. It is a non pecuniary interest. Yes. Yeah, so I think, I think you can um, you can stay in the room, but you can't um, can't vote. Is that right? Right. Okay. So sorry, 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 Chair. Members, I think as they are known associates of yours, they, they are no closer than that. They, they are not relatives, and they you, you do not have any sort of business dealings or business interests with them. That'd be uh, great. If they if they are known associates of you, then I think it's another interest <coughs> under the code of conduct uh, which would allow you to play in the meeting and uh, vote on the item. Thank you for the clarification. Right. Um, I'll <laughs> Sorry, Chair. Uh, we've, we've, we've got a, a, a legal profession who is going to spend the next four hours with us, and the first piece of the legal advice she gives us, based on her knowledge, we're, we're not taking any notice of. I, I, I realise, and, and Councillor Mill and I discussed this yesterday, I always work on the basis of, have I ever been for a pint with them? Have I ever been to their house? And then, you know, are you actual, would you class them as mates? Have you got them in your phone? And, and Councillor Mill said no to this, but I, I'm, I'm really conscious of, of the legal advice we've been given, plus the fact we would be called and and I understand the, the, the nature of and the reason that that application's here. I, I, personally speaking, I think I'd step out of the room, make life easier for everybody, even though that is completely unfair, because Jeremy has got a huge knowledge on the, the topography of that particular area, but I, I just... We have a legal representative for a reason, don't we? I, I, from speaking as a member. Uh, Chair, what, what do you require me to do? Um, it is in, ultimately, it's entirely up to you, um, Steve. Uh, well, if, if you will allow me to, Chair, I would, I would prefer to stay and contribute to the debate. But if 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 the genuinely the legal advice is that I should go, I obviously I will accept that. But can the can the legal officer give a definitive view on that particular? Councillor, mm -hmm. no. Chairman, you are correct. Oh. It is entirely up to the member individually. But my recommendation would be that that there is a um, non pecuniary interest, and whilst that would allow the member to participate, what the concern is is how that appears to the public at large the applicants, the objectors of how that member is participating in that application and weighing it up, the fact that the, the decision can still be made correct with that member not participating is what, <laughs> I just think you don't want the decision to be polluted um, with any accusations or any concerns of bias. That's what I have in my mind. So if it, if it is a non-pecuniary interest, that member can decide to, to stay and participate. That said, it does not look good to the public at large. Yes. Councillor Norman, you wanted to say something. <clears throat> um, I did, Chair, because this is a discussion we've had a number of times over the past many years. And uh, I think that the whole point is, this is a small county. We know so many people in a very minimal way. Um, I gather from Councillor Milne that he knows this person through another application, those as a councillor possibly, or as an expert, he's known this person. I mean, that's absurd. If we start to exclude ourselves on those sort of grounds, you know, we may be hore, but we're very much reduced. And I I'm very unhappy if this is the case. Clearly, if it's pecuniary, we know where we are. But otherwise, I think we've got to say, unless it's a social, friends, family relationship, um, no, that should not exclude us. Uh, can, I, can, I, can I say, I don't think we need to have a debate. <clears throat> Ultimately, this is a decision for the member, but I, I do ask him to bear in mind when we come to the vote, perhaps, you know, it may be academic anyway, um, to um, deal with that matter. Um, 
Sorry, uh, my understanding is if it's a non pecuniary interest, you can take part in the debate, but you can't vote. It's for the member to decide if he can make a decision with an open mind and that um, he can um, just be impartial with the with the application. It's just basically if it is refused and it, it, there's challenge to the application and it come, um, it come the accusations made, it's that there's a bias there. It's just something that the council just has to weigh and vet and, you know, having it and basically it, it just needs to be weighed up if a member can make a impartial decision that notwithstanding the fact that um, he has a connection, a non-pecuniary connection to the, the applicant. Can I, can I say, I'm sure Councillor Milne will be mindful of that. Um, yes. I, I will, of course, Chair. Thank you for the advice. I hope we can move on. Yes, thank you. Right. Um, minutes of the meeting held, as I outlined earlier, are the minutes of the meeting on the 31st of August 2022 approved? Can members please raise their hands for those in favour? Those in favour of the minutes on the 22nd of August, please show. <laughs> those against? Abstentions? Largely because that was uh, for members of the public, they weren't in the meeting at the time, so cannot verify the uh, minutes. Now we'll move on to, there are no chairman's announcements, so we'll now move on to the first application. I request that the public speakers present in person on the agenda on item six join the meeting. Mr. Dewars. Mr. Hardy, I'm sorry if I've mispronounced your name. Uh, uh, um, Mr. Hardy, local re residents, and Mr. Davis, the applicant's agent. Please, could you take your seats in the public participation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good morning. I welcome you to the meeting and I will call you to speak following the officer's presentation on the application. Okay, the officer. No, Ms. Heather Carlisle will make the presentation. Thank you, Chair, and also thank you to members of this committee who attended the site visit yesterday morning. As a procedural matter, and this was included on the update sheet issued yesterday, condition 29 has been amended following further discussions with national highways, out of condition 23 following further dialogue with the local highway authority. Also, also, a neighbour has sent in an additional two representations focusing on lack of consultation supporting material being added to the website. Again, this has been addressed within the update list. Also, earlier this morning, Mr Wakefield, the agent for the Lower Bullingham Strategic Allocated Housing Site, has made a verbal representation to the Ward Councillor, raising concerns about delivery of this strategic allocated housing site in light of the cancelling of the relief road. Mr Wakefield advised that this site should take prior priority over this application site. As members will be aware, this has been addressed in paragraph 6.98 and 6.99 of the committee report being discussed today. This application has been redirected to the planning committee by the local ward councillor, Councillor Rome, due to the number of representations received during the application <laughs> process. The application in front of members is seeking outline planning permission with all matters for access reserve for the erection of 230 residential dwellings, footway, cycleway, a vehicle turning head, stopping up and rerouting a short section of Grafton Lane near the A49, also including public open space, landscaping, landscaping, associated infrastructure works. The application site is located, located to the west of Ross Road, north of Grafton Lane, and south of the junction of Grafton Lane with Ross Road. The application site is identified in the usual manner by the Red Star on the screen in front of you this morning. 
This application seeks to secure 35% affordable housing as well as Section 106 contributions. As members will be aware, it is the principle of development and its access which is solely under consideration this morning. All other reserve matter elements, such as appearance, landscaping, layout, and scale, are not under consideration and would come forward with any subsequent applications under reserve matters. This would be a secondary process. Members will also note that this application was submitted back in 2019. The reason for the delay in getting the recommendation in front of members this morning is due to prolonged discussions between the applicant and National Highways, formerly known as Highways England, as the A49 forms part of the strategic road network. Next slide, please. This slide shows the extent of the application site is outlined in red, and the aerial view helps with context and its close relationship with Hereford City and the existing built of area, demonstrated that it can create a natural extension for the city of Hereford. You will note in the slides that the application site includes an area. Can I just jump in for a second, please? Uh, I'm the ward councillor for Lord Bullingham, and Lord Bullingham mentioned that there was an email that went to the ward councillor. Um, was that the ward councillor, Lord Bullingham? That should I be? Uh, it's relevant to this interview. Not relevant, just to make sure because it, it was mentioned. So I, I, you know, I need to question that. <laughs> Continue. Um, Sorry, you will note in the slide that the application site also includes an area extension to the south and the west of Bracken Lane associated with the drainage infrastructure and includes a dry pond, pumping station, and outfall into Billy Brook. As visible within the top plan and highlighted when on site yesterday, to the north lies the railway line which connects Hereford and Cardiff to the south and Birmingham to the north. To the east site lies the A49, known as Ross Road. This application site is located to the south of Hereford, an area known as Red Hill, and Rathlint will be located to the west of the site. The site is agricultural land, and the immediate environments of the site remain primarily agricultural in nature. This land is Grade 2, as identified within the Agricultural Land Cultivation and Transportation Land. Members will also note from reading the committee report that the application site area has been reduced in size with the removal of a southern parcel of land during the application process, reducing the size from 13.25 hectares to 10.09 hectares. The quantum of residential development land has also reduced from 300 to 230 dwellings. Next slide, please. This is the primary plan which has been submitted. This is the location plan and the site is shown as edge red. Can I direct members to the existing dwellings located to the northeast and northwest of the site, as highlighted by the blue circles? The proposed new access is off the A49 and is, and is highlighted by the yellow circle. And the proposed location of the outfall into the Withy Brook is shown on the plan by the green by the green circle. Next slide, please. As members are aware, this outline application is also considering access. Access means the accessibility to and within the site for vehicles, cycles, and pedestrians in terms of the positioning and treatment of access and circulation routes and how these fit into the surrounding access network. This application is seeking the creation of a new vehicle access, which is proposed of the A49. The proposal entails the formation of a new four armed signal control junction on the A49, which incorporates the existing priority junction with Romany Way approximately 65 metres south of the existing Grafton Lane Junction. Also, Grafton Lane will be stopped up for vehicle traffic to the west of Newlands, approximately 280 metres from the A49 Grafton Lane Junction. Pedestrian, cyclists and horses will still have access to the existing Grafton Lane and a turning head will be provided where Grafton Lane is proposed to be stopped up. This part of Grafton Lane will continue to serve the existing four properties on the eastern end of Grafton Lane and in effect will create a cul-de-sac for these properties. It is also noted that a section of hedgerow will be rem removed to facilitate this new vehicle access of Grafton Lane. Footpaths are located in pro close proximity to the site along Ross Road heading into the city and towards Brandon Lodge to the south. It is also noted that bus stops are located outside the application site along the A49. Further connectivity is to be secured by Section 106 improvements and includes connectivity along Ross Road to the Academy School by Nilston Road. Internal access and road arrangements 
would be fully considered at the, the matter stage. There is no public right of way which crossed the site, however, as we can see from the map, there is an existing footpath, which is shown as a yellow dot, which runs from Grafton Lane to the north, from the southwest corner of this, oh, sorry, sorry, runs Grafton Lane in the north from the southwest corner in a southerly easterly direction. Members will also be aware that the National Cycle Route 46 Sustrans by Grafton Lane is in close proximity to the site, and this is accessed by way of an underpass. Next slide, please. This slide shows where the proposed location of the new vehicle access into the site and the submitted plan demonstrates the proposed indicative details in regards to stopping up the Grafton Lane. Stopping up, as explained on, this, on site, and early extends just past the last bungalow along Grafton Lane and will include a turning head. This will be secured by a, a TRO process and details are to be scored by an appropriately worded condition. Photos show the proposed access location looking from Romany Way and the hedgeway to be removed at the bottom photograph of this Grafton Lane looking towards the Ross Road and the bungalows. Members are reminded after extensive discussions with National Highways, formerly Highways England, the application is deemed to be acceptable and also the local highway authority have raised no objection. Next slide, please. As previously highlighted, matters in respect of appearance, landscaping, layout, scale, all reserved matters are not under consideration in this morning as part of this application. However, an illustrative layout framework plan has been produced which demonstrates how the 230 houses can be delivered on the site along with car parking, the LEAP landscaping associated infrastructure, which includes the pumping station. Also, as a follow-up from yesterday's site visit, I can confirm based upon the proposal, the development land, developable land measures 5.3 hectares. Therefore, a scheme of 230 would equate to 43 dwellings per hectare. An area of public space is to be provided and that would be 2.21 hectares, play area, kickabout, and the leap totaling 0.13 hectares, pumping station 0.01 hectares, and the remaining infrastructure would equate to 2.56 hectares. This is all shown on the indicative plan as submitted. I stress again this is illustrative and any future reserve matter application will simply the layout, appearance, etc. Next slide, please. This plan again helps to visualise and also highlights the existing constraints of the site, the existing railway line to the north, and the existing veteran trees, which are to be retained, as well as the existing A49 road to the east. It also shows again its location in relation to the edge of Hereford City and demonstrates the location. Again, I remind members that the application in front of you has been reduced in size with the removal of the parcel of the land south following an initial landscape objection. There are no landscape constraints on the site, i.e. it is not an A or B, and there are currently no objection from the landscape officer. Albeit officers do acknowledge that this site is sensitive in nature and the proposed scheme will result in a change of landscape character. However, the impact on visual, sorry, the impact on the visual impact is considered to be minor. This plan also helps to show the two parcels of land and its relationship with Grafton Lane and Withybrook, which is located 250 metres to the south. In regards to drainage, drainage colleagues and Welsh Water have confirmed no objections to the principle of development subject to appropriate working conditions. And the foul drainage is to link to the existing Welsh Water network in Ross Road, but will need to be pumped. It is also noted that the ecologist has raised no objection and Natural England has raised no objection in regards to the, to the habitation regulations assessment. Can I also refer members to figure nine within the committee report at paragraph 6.66, which shows the preliminary biodiversity enhancement plan. This gives an indication of potential enhancements in regards to biodiversity, which can be secured during the matter stage through appropriately worded conditions. Next slide, please. The revised scheme has been amended to ensure the retention of the veteran trees, as well as amendments to the proposed footway along the A49 to ensure the root protection area. Root protection areas avoided. During the application process, tree preservation order has been served on the tree at the Grafton Lane Ross Road Junction. The agricultural officer has supplied comments and subject to suitably worded conditions to confirm no objection. Also, to confirm there are no listed buildings within the site, nor it is within a conservation area. 
closest listed building as shown on the map on slide as a blue dot. And again, I refer you to paragraph 6.81 of the committee report, which also confirms no objection from the archaeological advisor or any harm identified to heritage, asset, heritage assets. Next slide, please. Officers acknowledge that new development can impact on existing services and facilities. When considering infrastructure requirements, a draft head to term has been submitted as part of the committee report. And I refer you to paragraph 6.58. The section 106 agreement is still under negotiation and further discussion for the board member will occur prior to completion. However, please can I ask mm -hmm. to note that as part of this legal agreement, it will secure highway improvements, including footway improvements, affordable housing, and the provision of open space. The section 106 also secures financial contributions for healthcare, education, primary care, recycling, sports, and transport. Next slide. Oh, sorry, just let me go back one thing. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, just concluding there. We're getting there. <laughs> to sum up, neighbours have objected to the application site and have made representation. The application is for outline permission with all matters reserved except for access, and therefore it is only the principle of development that is to be assessed. The revised and reduced scale of development is considered capable of being accommodated on the site, but the deeper of this is not currently under consideration this morning. The accessibility of the site and connectivity within the city and its services is a major consideration due to its close relationship with the current built-up area. The site forms a natural extension to the city of Hereford and can be argued it is not physically or functionally isolated. It is in principle an appropriate location for residential intensification. The application site has been reduced, which has reduced the landscape harm. And now the size and the site is suitable for the quantum of development proposed and will maintain the character of the area as well as protecting the gateway into the city of Harrogate. After extensive dialogue with both the local highway authority and national highways, it's been concluded that the strategic and local highway networks can absorb the traffic impact of the development. Officers recognise that the proposal is on grade two agricultural land and concerns were raised by some members yesterday about the loss of good agricultural land which should be retained for food production. However, your officers consider that the loss of this land is justified to the location close to the city and the benefits of this proposal outweigh the loss of the agricultural fields. Finally, is it important to stress that this application would deliver housing in Hereford City where there is currently an under delivery of dwellings. The core strategy recognised the key role played by the city and state that Hereford will accommodate a minimum of 6,500 new homes within the planned period. This site offers significant contribution to that. When looking at housing delivery and commitments in regards to Hereford City, the current position indicates 845 commitments as of April 2022. In terms of completion, there have just been over 1,900 in the period 2011 to 22, specifically in Hereford, and this is compared to the target of 500 over the plan period. So even though we at the council are able to demonstrate a five-year housing supply in the county, there has been an under delivery of housing in Hereford itself. To conclude, the scheme is considered to accord with the policy development plan. It is found to be representative of sustainable development. Accordingly, having regard to all of the above, this application is recommended for approval and subject to the signing and final drafting of the section 106, along with the conditions proposed. Thank you, Chair. This brings the end to my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Corral. <clears throat> and now we'll come to the speakers. I invite Mr. Dewis, and apologies again for the for my pronunciation of the uh, real name, and Mr. Hardy, local resident, to speak. In objection to the application, you will have three minutes between you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, just very briefly, then. So, I'm a resident on Grafton Lane, three yards from this site perimeter. Uh, there's three things I just would like to mention today. I'm not against development as such, it is well planned and it's part of good infrastructure. Three concerns I have firstly is traffic, and I know the officers just mentioned about that as covered. Um, we see the A49 queued right down to the roundabout on the relief road, both morning and evening, and would be a concern to see 230 units of housing added to that road. It's first concern. The other two concerns are more 
not so much the outline, but I would like to make a note of that today. Um, so first point is, or the second point I'd like to make is the fact is the, the design of the housing puts the road for Grafton Village and the farm traffic going through like a dog leg through the whole estate, which is a health and safety concern. And it means the whole of the traffic of the village is going to have to go through that village. We would we'd recommend that there's a southern perimeter road if this is going ahead. Third point, just would like to say is, as the as the officer said, it is a noticeable site as you come up the hill. The design of that lane is you see some large dwellings, five or six dwellings. The recommendation, if I can don't make it today, is keep that design element of the larger housing around the perimeter, southern perimeter road, attached dwellings, whatever it is, and leave the dental housing behind it so you keep the ethic, you might say, the view intact. That's all I've got to say. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the committee. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairman. My name is George Hardy. I live on Grafton Lane, and today I'm represent, I represent the um, Grafton Residence Group. Okay. When there is a desperate nationwide need for housing stock, why then has this project been greeted with widespread alarm, concern, and derision? Is it because these properties will be unaffordable for many people already in Hereford? A recent comment in the Hereford Times, this new build is useless. Small, well-designed, cheap, single or double bedroom flats are what is needed here. Frankly, this is a very retro, unimaginative project. Let us see this project for what it is. It's profit driven. There's no harm in that. It will make some people very rich and it will generate income for the council. Fine. But it will do nothing to help people who are already here. In fact, it will do a lot of harm. It will attract more people to the area, young growing families, great. It will attract more vehicles using already congested roads. It will increase pollution, especially on an important gateway road into Her Hereford. I'm sure you all know all of this already, but yet here we are discussing this. Have you thought this project will put in danger the delicate ecosystem of the low lying areas around Withy Brook? For a month every year, the land around Withybrook floods, Grafton Lane floods in two places. Withybrook is our only runoff. This project is putting that in danger by pouring more water into it. Is this wise? This project will dump more traffic onto the other end of Grafton Lane, where there is a bottleneck. No one wants to drive on a meandering spine road through a housing estate with children playing, mums and toddlers, school run mayhem and park cars everywhere. It's dangerous. This project will make it more hazardous for the many ambulances that need to exit each day from Romany Way. It will put further strain on doctors' surgery, schools, and our hospital. Yeah. Councils, please reject this plan today. A more progressive way of dealing with the housing problem oh, is to encourage the extension. The Just a minute more. No, um, Ten seconds. Ten seconds. Ten, ten seconds. <laughs> okay. The fear of rejecting this project because of the cost of fighting an appeal, I understand, is a great concern. But to allow it is to leave forever a damnable legacy for all generations to come. Thank you. And now I'll move to the applicant, and Mr. Davis, agent. Thank you and good morning. Both the core strategy and MPPF provided presumption in favour of sustainable development. The core strategy identifies Hereford as the key focus for new housing development in the county on account of its role as the main centre with a wide range of services and ability to facilitate sustainable development. In this regard, the application site is located immediately adjacent to the built form of the city and within easy reach of its services, facilities and schools. The site is accessible by public transport, with frequent bus services stopping immediately adjacent to the site on the A49, whilst the proposed development seeks to maximise opportunities to improve pedestrian and cycling provision, as shown in the Sustainable Transport Plan at Figure 8 of the Planning Committee report. The core strategy identifies a minimum housing target of 6,500 for Hereford during the plan period. To achieve this target, there is a need for a variety of sustainable sites to come forward. This development of up to 230 units, 35% or 80 of which will be affordable, 
will positively contribute in this regard. The scheme is viable and deliverable in the short term and will boost the supply of homes in Hereford during a period of historic under-delivery. Both the core strategy and NPPF seek to address the challenges posed by climate change. The Council itself declared a climate emergency in March 2019, reinforcing its commitment to tackling climate change in its decision-making processes. A detailed energy statement and climate change checklist were submitted as part of the outline submission that set out Taylor Wimpy's commitment to achieving energy reductions at this site. Measures in this regard will be incorporated into detailed design moving forward. The application has been accompanied by a full suite of supporting technical assessments and reports. These have demonstrated that there will be no adverse impacts and as a result, no technical consultee objections have been received in relation to the proposed development. As stated within the report, extensive highway related modeling work was undertaken during the course of the application process. National Highways and the local Highway Authority since confirmed that the proposed development will not result in any unacceptable impacts on the highway network and have raised no objection to the proposed development. The applicant has agreed to the draft heads of terms as outlined in the Planning Committee report, which will deliver significant contributions via Section 1 and 6. Section 38.6 of the Planning Act states that the determination of this plan and application must be made in accordance with the development plan unless other material considerations indicate otherwise. In this regard, and as the officer's report concludes, the scheme is considered to accord with the development plan and is found to be representative of sustainable development. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Exactly three minutes. Please, thank you. Right, as the public speakers take their place back in the mm -hmm. Thank you. We now come to the local member, is Councillor Councillor Rowan, who is the vice chairman. He does not have a vote in this uh, and matter, but will interview in the debate. He has a ten minute uh, limit on his presentation, and uh, I could speak at the end in the winding up. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, a uh, big thank you to Heather Carlisle for what a really thorough and well balanced report for us to consider. I don't think any of us realise how many hours, probably even weeks, she spent working on this. Um, the idea of building houses on this site has been mooted for a number of years now. The public consultation held at the Hereford Academy was either in the end of 2017 or early 2018, and it was very well attended. Uh, the, as we've heard, the, origin, uh, the original application was for 300, that's reduced to 230. We've heard principally that was to, so that the the skyline as you approach the city was not taken up with housing. Um, I've never really been all that keen on this application, but I understand the need and appreciate the position of this site for housing close to the city. I've always believed that the natural line, and it wasn't really crossed over until we had a development in Bullingham Lane, the natural line was the, uh, the railway line. And if you look at the map, you can actually see it. But we had Thorsby Drive development, which came along, and I think that really broke the back of it, and that took away the taboo of crossing over the railway line. As you will understand, at the time of the initial proposal, we in the city were due to have a bypass. The time sales were such that the Southern Link Road, linking the A465 to the A49, and then onto Rotherus, would be built as this estate was developed, and then the full alternative to crossing the city would follow. Here we are now, though, with no link road or bypass, and a proposal for an additional 750 plus vehicle movements a day via traffic signals in an already busy area. National highways have conditioned any approval of this site, so vehicle movements on and off of the proposed development must be acceptable. Uh, the other consultees, we must, must note Welsh Water, no objection, subject to conditions. Natural England, no objection. Network Rail conditions, but no objection. Ecology, the same. Landscape, the same. Area, engineer, highways, no objection. It should be added, though, that the path that runs along the A49, uh, which will be the most obvious route for walking from this development, receives almost nil maintenance 
vegetation clearance and it does grow over very quickly. I am heartened though that this is conditioned to change depending on the outcome today. The additional footway through to Mearston Road from the A49 footpath would be a wonderful asset for the youngsters of building with schools close to. Uh, but I do know that it is in the gift of Connexus. Uh, I'm sure though, as a the largest social housing provider, they would be only too keen if anyone's listening. Although this development is on the National Cycle Network number 46, anyone traveling to or from this proposed estate on a push bike will naturally be using that pre-mentioned footpath adjacent to the A49 and not the recommended National Cycle Network 46, unless it was for a leisure ride rather than a commute. And I know a number of members yesterday who are keen cyclists have used that route because it is really flat. It takes you all the way around to Belmont, Haywood, Country Park, and all the exciting things that are happening there over the next couple of years. There is a bus stop very close to the proposed new entrance of the estate, and residents will be served by the numbers 33 and 38, which has served me well when I was a teenager growing up and I lived out in the sticks. Uh, a request by me for a bus pull-in was not forthcoming there, I'm afraid to say, which is a pity. Uh, outdoor sports investments of almost £1,300 per unit amounts to some possibly £300,000. Uh, contributions for hockey will go to the leisure centre. For cycling, we'll go to the leisure centre. For football, we do get a little bit. King George playing fields, which isn't in the Red Hill Ward, but it's close. Belmont and Newton Farm also get some. And then there'll be money going to Broomy Hill and Tuxley. Cricket, any funds there, are going to White Cross, King's Acre, Bishop's School and Lugwardine. The rugby, it goes to the Hereford Rugby Club, which is just across the way from this site. Still not on the area though, and it also goes to uh, Grandstand Road. It's strange to note, but it is noteworthy, and I hopefully from member input that will change. That not one penny piece will be spent in the area for the ward of the proposal. I am led to believe though that these are just examples of where the money will go, and the local authority will work with the Sports Investment Partnership and the councillor for Red Hill decide which projects are the best place to receive any monies. As we must always remember, this is only an outline planning application. Sport England do state in this report that occupiers of new residential developments will generate demand for sporting provision. Let's hope we can identify facilities a little closer than Kingsacre Road, Hampton Park or Barter Street. For me, though, the one striking feature of this proposed development is that the four homes that we viewed yesterday, members, at the entrance to Grafton Lane will no longer be in the open countryside, but sited in a housing estate. So subject to what happens today, I'd like to say to the residents, I wouldn't like to name them, but I'm not allowed to, the residents of Hillcrest, Hockley, Newlands and Oakview, my apologies. They will be in a cul-de-sac and they will be able to let their hedges grow, which may make the outlook more acceptable and familiar to what they're used to at the moment. But the whole outlook for them will change from rural to urban. Once again, I reiterate, this is only an outline planning application, just the principle of building on this site. I will, however, at this early stage, put a plea to the developer when it comes to details. Please build these homes to a future-proof standard. It's a long time before it becomes compulsory to do so, so let's start now. We all know that utilities will be the largest cost to running a home, and I remember one of our former colleagues, Mark Hubbard, 10 years ago, highlighted this at a planning committee, which I sat on at Brockington. The cost of running a home from here on in, so why not have passive house standard build quality, especially for social housing? This site could be an example of how to of how to rather than same old. Yes, the build cost is higher, but the savings of some 70% on electric, still a little bit of gas, but mainly electric, the use of it creates the thousands of pounds a year now for the average house. So to come uh, sum up, uh, fellow committee members, am I happy with this site? I'm going to sit on the fence. The good points though, it's easy to walk to schools. No youngster who leaves this site will walk to the Hereford Academy or to Marlbrook School will ever need to cross a road 
at any point on their walk. It is on the main bus, bus route, and I will say, if it is accepted today, it'll be a wonderful place to live. Bad though, the bad point to me is a lot of land, terribly inconvenient for the residents, which we've heard for, who live further down Grafton Lane, and the effect on the four homes. But I'm gonna sit on the fence. I will be interested to hear what everyone has to say there. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Rohn. And now we'll begin the debate. I've got no speakers on my list, Councillor. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you uh, again to Scott uh, Adam for uh, giving a very comprehensive report. I must say, and thank you to our board member too, who gave us some interesting information. Uh, I'm concerned uh, after hearing the spirited uh, speech by uh, one of our speakers concerning the brook and the flooding problems down there. Uh, how, how serious is that? And it sounds like it happens on a very regular basis. And does it affect this site at all? Does it affect other people, other, other dwellings, other farms, um, and so on? Uh, I'm also quite surprised that traffic lights were considered the ideal uh, option rather than a big roundabout. Um, but there we are. Uh, it seems that that's what highways, national highways, consider as best. But I, I think Right? You consider otherwise. Okay. And also, may I say that I am also concerned about the loss of good agricultural land. Great too. Uh, we might one day rue the loss of growing food potential in this part of the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you, um, Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Bowen, um, for your comments. In respect to, um, in terms of flooding um, and specifically in respect to the Withy Brook. Um, I refer back to in terms of the extensive dialogue with the, um, the local lead flood authority, our drainage colleagues, and also in this instance with um, national highways and in terms of national highways were involved in respect of, um, in terms of assessing the sort of the outfall into Withy Brook, because it's in, in terms of its close proximity to, to the A49. So you will see in terms of, again, this is outlined and in terms of some of the prescriptive conditions that are added at, at the end of the report, um, do detail in respect to further information that is required in respect of <coughs> supplying information. In, again, I refer you in terms of the, in terms of the, um, the size of the application of a flood risk assessment had to be submitted. And again, through dialogue with our drainage authority, um, they, they've come back with no, with no objection. In terms of, I suppose, in terms of local residents, um, nothing, nothing has been highlighted in, in the correspondence that I've received from, from my technical colleagues to say in, in terms of flooding issues for that. In, in regards to the, um, regarding sort of the loss of agricultural land, as I said in my, um, you know, my initial sort of presentation, yes, we, you know, as an officer, I acknowledge that it is grade two. However, in terms of, in this instance, Due to the location of the site um, and in respect of the, the benefits that myself and the local planning authority see that way in terms of the, the loss of the 10 acres um, in, of, of agricultural land for, for housing. Thank you. Councillor Mill. Uh, yes, thank you. Just to uh, follow on from uh, what Councillor uh, Councillor Byrne just asked, and I'm grateful to the case officer for clarifying those two points that I raised at the site meeting yesterday, namely the business of the uh, uh, the agricultural land classification and i think she, uh, you acknowledge i believe uh, Ms. carlisle that uh, uh, an approval would put us in conflict with nppf paragraph 179 uh, which advises us not to develop best, the best and most versatile agricultural land and uh, i i recognize your argument in doing that in namely that we're offsetting it by 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 by, by public benefit and to achieve the best of public benefits out of out of that, to make the best of it, uh, uh, we uh, and you've addressed the other question I had, which was around the density. Uh, at one point six in your report, you suggested that the density was thirty nine units per per hectare. Um, in fact, it is twenty two point eight units per hectare of the whole site. And you explain that by saying, "Well, we we deduct the area that is." used for infrastructure and so on, so you know, all the roads and things, uh, 
Uh, so we, you're, you're calculating it on a basis of slightly less than the full site area, which brings the density down, uh, uh, which brings the density up, sorry, to, to, to nearly 44 uh, units per hectare. And, and that obviously, if you use that metric, is a, is a better uh, use of the land if you're, if you're making that argument for using best, most productive agricultural land. Um, I mean, I would say uh, that uh, if you're using that much space for infrastructure, for roads, basically, are we doing the right thing by sustainable travel? And we looked yesterday at the connectivity of the site for pedestrians, which has to be along the A49 across, along a narrow pedestrian path, past a, through a, a death bridge and along past fast moving traffic down the A49 to get anywhere near Marlborough Primary School. I wouldn't let my primary school aged children down that pavement. It's only two feet wide at the moment. And I know that there was a suggestion that we might spend 106 monies, 106 monies to, to improve it. We should not be spending 106 monies to do that. It's Highways England's infrastructure. We shouldn't be spending High Bridge Council's money to, to, to uh, cross uh, uh, subsidise Highways England. We need a conversation with Highways England to say, for goodness sake, get your man out there to improve to 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 improve the footpath. That's the first thing to do. It's basic stuff. All councillor work. It should be done, uh, and then we can look at it again. But at the moment, it's completely unfit for sending anybody down, which is exactly why nobody walks down it. Which is exactly why it is only two feet because there's so much litter and crap on it. Well, we 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 we. Uh, the other question I had, if you'll give me another couple of seconds. A couple of seconds at most. Uh, was introducing safe access, direct access to Marlborough, to Hedrick Academy and so on, going straight across the railway line, across the, across the line of the, the cutting. Delivering that would give us... I'm sorry, Councillor. Okay, I, I finished, but thank you, for, thank you for giving me a good three minutes, Matt. Which out. to scrutiny by your concern and objectors and... Some... Yeah. Yeah. It's jolly hard work. Thank you, Councillor uh, Milne, and uh, also thank you for your input yesterday um, on site. Just, just to clarify for, for members and um, for uh, 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 sort of people in the, in the public gallery, just to clarify, it, in terms of the um, cutting back of the vegetation on the existing pedestrian path down the A49, that is not part of the heads of terms in the section 106. The I think it's condition 29, which has been suggested by Highways England, is for that to be undertaken. It, it's not. It's not. It would be sort of. It's not part of the funding report as uh, part of the, um, the section the section 106. By that matter. I obtained that from one of the applicants' drawings that said that. Okay, yeah. and, and also just, just to um again, just, just to confirm, and I think I touched on it yesterday when we we're on site, but again for members um here this morning, is that in respect of the um in terms of connectivity um over the railway line, please be reassured that um you know your officers, as soon as this application landed in my intro, that was one of the, the initial discussions or raised that we had with the with the applicant and their agent. Mm -hmm in terms of investigating a pedestrian and cycle route um, over the existing railway line. Unfortunately, as I'm sure you can appreciate, in terms of a scale of development for 230 and the potential financial implications of a pedestrian crossing over the railway, that can you know, end up being millions of pounds. Like Councillor Rowan, I think, was also involved in some initial sort of meetings as well, where we've got it on this table. So please be reassured, it has been investigated, but unfortunately this application, if what we deem to be um, the reach for um, the delivery of, of, of per se, um, pedestrians and bridge out over the rail. Councillor Thomas. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have regular complaints about uh, parallels at 849 uh, and possibly one of the most dangerous roads in the county. Having another access onto the 849 for me is very disconcerting. Um, I've stood on the side of that road a number of times with, with the various officers, et cetera, trying to get safety things in place. It's just a dangerous road. And adding more, another access to that road, to me, it just seems, I don't know. I don't understand the thank you. Thank you. 
I do believe I do believe it is supposed to be a controlled access. So um, it wouldn't be a free rule. Yeah, most of the roads are there's supposed to be controlled access, etc. The stop signs that get turned around and all kinds of stuff out there. It's just plain dangerous and the residents have an issue. So any access on the 849 is an issue, I'm afraid. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, can I... yeah, yeah. Just, just, got... just to clarify, Councillor Thomas, it is a signalized um controlled junction. And again, just to reiterate, in terms of the um the national highways they've been actively involved in looking at in terms of the you know in terms of safety and maneuverability of that junction and they've confirmed their in their opinion that it's, uh, it's acceptable chairman but i just said the, the legal advisor please sorry I'm grateful, Chairman. I think um, to address members' concerns about the highway safety, it, it's pertinent that we hear from the highway the highway expert that's present today. Maybe if they provide some commentary. It's national highways, not our local highway authority. Yeah. Yeah, We've got national highways comments fully within the report, and they're fully fully um, they advise them the. Um, the, the officer and, and, and their comments as I say were in the report to, to go with their recommendations for conditions. Thank you. But it, it would be good to have their opinion. Well, it's, it is contained in the report. Mm -hmm. their opinion. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Uh, Councillor Watson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm quite interested in about being a cyclist and now cycling for us and why on a regular basis too here. Um, I've become quite familiar with the cycling paths and my issue is that when I'm looking at this map, and I'm sorry that I was unable to make it yesterday, is about the um, Heritage Council's PRO um, officers um, about saying that HER 52A is a footpath. Is there um, any plans to make it into a dual cycle path or to make it into a cycle track and is that within the jurisdiction of the um so that I've got several questions sorry Heather so uh, so that's the first one um actually where is uh the 46 um on the map and um, I think I'm picking up on the future proofing because it's about looking at um not only the electric vehicles but it's about the accessibility to and from the site the A49 pavement, is that going to be extended to make it a dual cycle track as well? So again, offering flexibility. Um, and do we have that right to scrutinize or opportunity to scrutinize national highways about those opportunities of changing their infrastructure to meet our, our, our demands? My Final two points is that, and it's a silly question, I'm, I'm sorry, is that the hockey stick bit, um, that's not quite steam, um, but on this bit here, is that going to be infill um, in the future? Is that, um, and uh, the last point is that we've had a member's briefing about S106 monies this week, and, and I just have to make a plea that members' involvement is crucial within looking at how SO1, S106 money is spent yes. within their local area, please. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, um, Councillor Watson. Um, I'm going to go on your last question. <laughs> running, running backwards, if that's right. Um, again, in respect to Section 106, fully um, take on board your comments. And as Councillor Rowe um, said in his, um, his speech, is that the Ward Council will be actively involved in the sort of the finalising of the, in terms of the section 106 and where the money has been spent. Um, again, just to reassure you that Councillor Rowan has shared the, um, in terms of the heads of terms prior to this meeting um, and prior to being published within the committee report. But again, acknowledge um, your, your comments on, on that. Part. In respect to when you refer to the sort of the hockey shape, that I think that's in respect to the I suppose the drainage outfall. Um, I think my understanding that that will be in terms of sort of like pipes, it will be sort of it, it won't be sort of visible as per se. Um, in again, your question regarding the duality of the the existing pedestrian footpath um, along the A forty nine. My understanding at the moment is that that path is solely a pedestrian path it's not a shared um sort of dual sort of facility with cycleways um i think that i think i might ask 
can't um, Mr. Bishop to, to, to sort of just to sort of um, help me on this, but I think my understanding is probably just go out of the jurisdiction of this application in terms of there'd be further dialogue on whether or not it would need in terms of the, the whips that in terms of shared cycleway and, and paths, but this application it is solely as a pedestrian link, not as a shared one. Um, going in respect to your question regarding Grafton, in terms of Grafton, sorry, in terms of the Sustrains cycle 46, my understanding, I think my understanding is it is the actual the Grafton Lane is the is, is the cycle route yeah. and in terms of that further connectivity. Um, your first question and my final answer will be in respect of the public right of way. Um, again, if not, because it's outside of the application site, so this is outside of the, the red line of this application, it's not under consideration, you know, again, for it being extended um, for a sort of a, sort of again, a cycle or a footway. At the moment, I think if you, if you were on site or if you know the site, it's, it is a rural footpath, it's, it goes across fields. So there would be in the you know, my, my opinion is it would if it ends up being a shared cycle and pedestrian um, route, then that would potentially urbanize it even more where um, it, is, it is a rural public right of way across the fields from um from from Ross, from Ross Road to up to Grafton. Mm. Thank you. So, yeah, 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 on there because I think that it's about we've got 230 houses. And um, if it's going to be still a rural track, um, I think that it's about accessibility. You know, as you're saying, is that this we've got to focus on the accessibility, and it's about that um, kind of pathway. But um, but yeah, but thank you for your your points. And the other thing is that because of the hockey stick pipeline, that field in between will can't be used because once you've got the red line. Does that become an infill site? I'm no, sorry. No, 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 it no wouldn't it wouldn't. be subject to any um, applications in the future. It really, it, no, it, it definitely wouldn't. We mustn't, we mustn't preempt or prejudge mm. an actual application for what actually goes on there. Um, Councillor Norman. Thank you. And uh, first of all, um, share the um, appreciation of the report thank you very much very detailed and very very helpful and likewise the board members um, introduction to this um, a number of the points i would like to have made have been touched on so i won't go into huge detail on those uh, as we've been done already really but um just to uh, very much agree with points being made about loss of agricultural land uh, concern about the traffic this will this will increase um and the point made also, I think, by the by the local member about the need for quality housing. I know it's not what we're looking at at this point, but I do think we all absolutely agree that sustainability of the build is absolutely vital. It's it's astonishing at this day and age with energy prices and shortages we've got that we're still building inadequate houses in terms of energy efficiency. So that is essential. Um, back in 2012, we agreed as a council almost unanimously that all housing built in this county, we should do everything we could to ensure it was passive house or equivalent. The responsibility was taken away and, and is rests at the national level now, but it's even more important than it was before. A uh, quick, quick comment, uh, including let's make sure these houses have uh, outdoor space, good sized gardens in many instances, and green space generally. They are sitting in. I think that's absolutely vital. Um, uh, yeah, we talked about the. Uh, I, I also wanted to share or at least express my actual agreement with the first comments made by the landscape officer. Okay, some mitigation has taken place, but this is going to impact hugely on the the, the, the visibility uh, at the entrance to the city. And to me, that's a, a great pity and, and a great loss of this. It's very attractive area and jumping the railway, of course, opens up all sorts of possibilities, which I don't think are very happy um, in the future. Um, a couple of quick points to add to that. Um, I hope we can be reassured that drainage to the brook is not going to impact on the um, on the, the situation we have in our rivers. That does worry me. And I hope we can be assured that every possible step is being taken to avoid that. Uh, and finally, the veteran trees, I gather there's a TPO on one of them. There were four or five really fantastically 
uh, important trees in my view, whether they qualify technically as veteran, I don't know, but they all seem to me to have a huge value in their own right, as well as an amenity value to people living in the area. So I hope if this goes ahead, that can be retained. And last point, I've got a second, is uh, to agree with the points that have been made very adequately already about accessibility. We must ensure that people can travel safely, walking ideally or cycling uh, into town should be possible to reach the services that they actually need. Uh, so on balance, there are a lot of things against this application. There clearly are some benefits on that other side and I'm kind of listening and considering quite where we go with this. Thank you. Council Proverb. Uh, I just wanted to clarify with the connect to the summers. Um, I live that side of the river and I do feel that putting more traffic onto this road will, will cause quite a few problems. I know we say we've got a school over there, but as of having children of school age, the majority of children don't go to the local schools, they've been traveling across town. We've already got a large amount of traffic lights on that road, and I, I do feel that that's more prominent. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Milmore. Um, yeah, uh, the impression that was given earlier on that there was going to be no affordable housing on this site, but um, looking at the application, there's 105 affordable houses. Um, no, 80. 80, 80, can I just type there's 81 affordable houses? 81, yeah. okay. So that there are going to be affordable houses on this site. 35%. Yeah. Um, uh, also, um, in terms of the current residents, um, we cannot judge this application on whether they're going to lose their view or not, um, because people don't own the view. Um, as for traffic, I think um, I think the administration does have have a responsibility here because of the consequences of cancelling Southern Link Road, um, and if it means that you know we can't um, expand city and give people houses to live in, um, I think. Um, there is a there are some sort of consequences <laughs> that are starting to become apparent in um, cancelling of the uh, of the um, the traffic streams. So, but I would say that looking at everything here, um, the lack of objections from various uh, agencies, I can't see how we can object to this application. Really, and I, I would propose that we we approve this application. Is that a proposal? It is indeed. That's yeah. the, is there a seconder for that proposal? Is there an alternative proposal then? Well, I'll propose that we refuse it if we wait. But we need we need we need to, to establish whether there's a second or third. For the proposal. It doesn't seem to be. Um, I'd caution you to be very, very careful of this particular matter. We're already um, having to find nearly half a million pounds worth of costs for application in Lebury. Um, uh, Councillor Andrews. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I don't think anyone can deny that we need housing in Hereford, but it needs to be housing of the right sort. And could I make a plea that? We need smaller, smaller dwellings, not four or five bedroom dwellings, dwellings that can afford. And particularly, one of my particular requests, we need far more two bedroom bungalows so that older people can downsize. Uh, but I do have particular anxieties. We, although uh, Mrs. Carlisle said that we're short of the number of houses that we're supposed to build in areas, but our infrastructure is not keeping up. There is a huge development north of the road, uh, the A49, as you go out towards Le Le Lempster. It's more or less a new town out there. And our hospital and our school, our schools are virtually at capacity. And our hospital is, um, has a sometimes over 100% bed occupancy rate. And I see no mention of improving these facilities particularly. I may yeah. say the sporting facilities, I'm very interested to see, see that the sporting facilities in my particular ward, which is north of the city, seem to be going to benefit. But I do feel that more efforts be made for the people south of the city 
to benefit from this development. I feel very ambivalent about it. I think like a lot of people here, but I think perhaps we, we really, we've been in great difficulty we actually refused it. So in the end, I think I will have to support Councillor Bill Boyd in going for this application. With great reluctance, I might add. Is that second? I will second it. Second. Not with any enthusiasm, I might say. Uh, Councillor Bowen, I think. I, I, I think. Um, um, just one moment. Sorry. Uh, if I could just come back on a couple of points there for Councillor Andrews, just to reassure her. Um, the applicate the uh, housing officer has advised on the, on the type and style of housing which is which is, which is required, which will be required for the development, uh, and including the housing mix. And that does include bungalows, not only for the open market side, but also for the affordable housing side as well. Not enough. <laughs> but but it, the, there, there is quite a substantial, and, the, and that is in, in accordance with our with the, uh, the requirements for the council as a whole. So that, that, that's where we've got, um, so there's a complete mix there of housing in accordance with, our, with, with, your, with your policy. Still not enough bungalows. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I think many of us feel the same as Councillor Andrews. It's sucking your teeth pretty hard and saying you're okay, but with many reservations in mind. And I hope if we do pass this, the further consultations and development proposals will uh, mitigate some of the harm and concerns being expressed today. As a matter of interest, of all the given planning applications for housing, how many have been actually fulfilled? How many are, are unfulfilled? Could, you, could uh, Mr. Bishop perhaps enlighten us as to that? Because it seems mad to be building a lot more houses when there's so much unfulfilled housing. Uh, well, I can only give you at the present time at Hereford, in Hereford City, where uh, Mr. Ballard identified to you that there was a need for six, six and a half thousand units, which were identified through the court of um, You've got 1,900 which have been completed. Mm -hmm. And Whoa. 845, which are commitments. Now, to enable the council to, con to continue maintaining a five year housing land supply, it's sites such as these which must come forward. Otherwise, we'll fall into that position where we will, we've already fallen down from 6.9 to 6.19, and that trajectory coming down will come perilously close to five, to five years. And you know, We've been in a, in a position before when we've had an under five and um, under five years supply, and that is perilous for the council. It's perilous for the for the county as a whole because across the whole county, your adopted policies become out of date, and the precedent is given to granting plan, more planning permissions, not less. And that's why sites such as this. Uh, Bringing forward larger sites such as this are imperative to maintain your five-year housing land supply. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, what can we do about trying to make sure people do complete their applications and when they've been granted? Mm -hmm. It's crazy having them sitting around doing nothing. Well, they do. They do because uh, you don't want them to complete them all at all at once. If you complete them all at once, they drop off the end of the end of the list, and you you you, you need to be more to, to be more on. So. That that eight hundred and forty five is not, you know, they will, they are coming forward, and a lot of that will be involved in the the site which Councillor Mill 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 has at Laws up at 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 Homer, well for that for that for that site as well. So that that is why, and um, you you can't drag them to the table to build. I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah. yes. Having said that, if if suddenly they completed those eight hundred houses. We would drop off. They would drop off the, the list, and we would be. I think would be below the five year. Well, we need to get another eight hundred then. Yeah, we'd have to get it very quickly because then, we, if we did that and didn't have houses uh, on, on, on the, uh, the permission, we'd suddenly find ourselves below five, but we would then have no control over planning applications. Essentially, rock a hard place come to mind. Yes. yes. Um, are there any other speakers? We've had a, a proposal and seconder, first Councillor Milmore and Andrews, uh, for accepting the, the officer's recommendation. Was there any, there was no change to that recommendation? Uh, and I've come to the, to 
just to Bishop will give a final summing up. Thank you, Chairman. Um, a well, a well-rounded debate. Thank you, thank you, members, on this uh, uh, on the on this application covering all the all, all the various aspects. Um, obviously, access is your main consideration. The principle to develop the site that is that is a key consideration for today. Um, the devil will be in the detail, as they say. That will be in the in the subsequent plans, which, which we worked up the style, etc. Um, and quality of the housing. Um, I suggest I suggest we could add a note to the um, the permission is granted. We can add a note to the permission uh, re 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 um, re requesting the highest possible standard of build on 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 the site um, for you uh, as as a result of your debate today. Um, looking at looking at access, um, knowing the area very well um, as I do. I think the, the 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 four four lane four armed um, traffic light junction will actually be a benefit to the A forty nine because it'll actually stop stop speeding traffic coming up that up that road as well. Um, um, national highways to give you confidence of of confirmed that they that they are content with the proposal and uh, content with the conditions which are being proposed. So are so to our our local our local highway authority. The section one and six contributions. Yes, we have to identify where they potentially can be spent, and they will be spent in conjunction with discussion with the local member. And where they can be spent in the local ward, they will be spent in the local ward. Uh, and I'm sure the local member will be keen keen to achieve that. And that will be a key a key factor um, on any development site um, moving forward across uh, across the county. That local members are, are fully infor uh, informed. Of where that section 106 money will be spent. You've heard the debate relating to the agricultural land in terms of its development and the uh, within the planning balance taken on board the the, the need for the for the uh, for the housing and in particular the affordable housing as well 80 80 plus units which will be uh, 80 units which will be provided as part and parcel of this scheme which is obviously quite a significant um uh, within the within the within the within the planning balance so all in all chairman a good debate uh, a, a debate which um uh, centered around the key issues uh, for the site and as you referred the site has been has been retracted back from what it what it was due to comments which have been received and the work of the of the case officer with regards that mm. and uh, the ward member so thank you mm. so sure, might I just add one other consideration to that we should also demand, as we should always demand, the highest quality of design. Yeah, well, I'm afraid this design comes at a later stage. Yeah. When we but I mean, that's one of the core details. things that you were it's talking one about. Of the core, if I can come in, Chairman, that's one of the core things, and as members would have seen more, more recently, has been a key factor in planning policy moving forward. Uh, and as we move forward, that will be a key factor in the, in, the, in the discussions on this site as well. I'm very glad to hear that, but it hasn't always been. Um, Part of the no, debate. Right. I think I've got our hand up, Chairman. Legal advice. Yes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I was just looking at the conditions. Um, does Hevershire does Hevershire Council um put the section um two seven eight highway agreements as something to be um to receive um to be um just just considered by members. Is that something that needs to be ratified? A highway agreement here? Ms. Clow, don't question what you The 278 will be a separate issue dealt with by the Highway Authority in conjunction with national highways in conjunction with the um, uh, with the, de the developers' uh, pro progress and the development of this site. Mm -hmm. And there is a linking condition for. Um, there is actually a linking condition requiring that to be, be completed before uh, development occurs on site. Council Washington, briefly. Yes, I was just going to pick that up too um, about the separate agreement that was brought through by Network, uh, Network Rail as well, is that they've asked for conditions around S106 and around a separate agreement um, around um, the um, uh, ashing use. It's actually in the report, um, so I'm just bringing it up as well because it's not just national highways uh, separate agreement. It's also okay. net, uh, net. Yep, I, I think I get what you're saying. Mm -hmm. uh, 
in, I was say, in, terms, in terms of network rail, they, they've been additional um, correspondence. They've updated. They've updated their condition, haven't they? There's a condition. Um, separate agreement. That's a separate agreement. Um, sorry, what, what what do you want for insurance from from the, the Ashes Farms level crossing? Yeah, yeah. Um, it was just picking up on what the legal advisor was saying. It's not just one agreement, you know, like with right. national highways. It's actually an agreement with the rail company as well. Right, I think we're taking on board. I, I will now go at close the debate. Councillor Rowan. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, I, I thought it would be close. I didn't think it was going to be as close as this. but. Uh, I, I would like to have heard from more members, but um, we are where we are, so over to you, Chair. Thank you. I think we've heard from most of our members anyway. There is a proposal, a proposal on the table uh, following the office's recommendation as outlined in, in the report. Can I have uh, those in favour, please show. Just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Those against? One, two, three, four, five, six. Abstentions? No. Um, that is carried. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I'll have a 10 minute. We're, we're recording, oh, Chair. Yeah. Can I welcome you back to the meeting following an adjournment? We're now moved to the second application on this item. Item agenda item number eight. Could I ask Mr. Carley on behalf of Callow and Haywood Parish Council and Mr. Sean, the applicant, please take a seat in the public gallery for the participation take place. Mr. Carley. Mrs. Carley. Number eight. Sorry. Mr. Carley. Sorry, Chair. You said item eight and it's item seven. All right, it is. Sorry. <laughs> Is still the second application. Yes, <laughs> it was down on my list today. <laughs> and we'll have a written, written statement read by the clerk from Mr. Priddle. Will be read by the clerk. Take your place. Right, we'll now move to the presentation of the um, the, the item. Uh, Ms. Elfie Morgan will now make a presentation on this application. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to members for their time on site yesterday morning. I'd firstly like to draw members' attention to the update sheet with regards to the requested information by drainage. Details were provided and reconsultation sent to the engineers, and I've received comment that uh, no objection is held to the proposed development, but proposed drainage mound I mentioned should be added to the layout plans the clarification and construction purposes should it be approved. As such, the refusal reason two in the officer's report is no longer required as the only residual issue is the sizing of the mound itself. This application seeks permission for the construction of a single storey dwelling with workshop garage on land associated with Rome Fire, one of a number of converted farms traditionally associated with Hay Lodge. The site itself is an undeveloped uh, former orchard and access to the site was approved under previous application with the proposed driveway extending from this. Sorry, Sorry we've got a technical problem over there. The site is indicated by Red Star on a parcel of land set back from the existing dwellings with open agricultural land to the west. Recognising that the site is not isolated in the truest sense of the word, the closest settlements are located approximately one mile to the west, being Grafton, visible on the slide, and Belmont, approximately 1.3 miles to the northeast. Next slide, please. The site is within Callow and Haywood neighbourhood development area where the NDP is made and afforded for the way. Policy CH9 directs new housing in Grafton in the first instance. <laughs> I recognise there is a second leg to CH9, 
the wording of which has allowed a more flexible interpretation of the policy, enabling development within or adjacent to existing clusters of buildings or built up areas across the whole parish. In your officer's view, this would run contrary to the established spatial strategy of the core strategy. The NDP does divide smaller neighbour uh, settlements across the neighbourhood area at paragraph 4.1.12, which includes Bullinghope, Fortway, Grafton and Merry Hill, which does provide a logical steer as to where new housing could be considered acceptable in accordance with the neighbourhood planning manager's comments. However, none of these smaller settlements are the subject of this application. The officer's report provides a full clarification of the policy interpretation at paragraph 6.5 to 6.16, concluding that this is an open countryside site, meeting no exceptional criteria under RA3. Further to this assessment with regards to sustainability, though the proposal has taken consideration to achieve uh, energy, high energy efficiency levels and incorporate renewable energy sources, these are not considered to outweigh the identified harm with regards to unsustainable location. The occupants would be reliant on motor vehicle, their everyday services and facilities, given the distance between any settlement and the proposal site, as well as limited opportunity for public or active travel. The closest bus stop is approximately one mile from the application site, accessible via the C1226, which is without pavement or street lighting, making it unsafe for pedestrians. There is a public footpath linking to the fringes of the city, though it is an informal path pathway limiting accessibility. Next slide, please. The proposed dwelling takes reference from a modern agricultural shed style architecture <laughs> in a simple rectangular form. The outbuildings include workshop and garage, a proposed in a similar utilitarian style constructed of metal profile cladding to match the host dwelling. The dwelling would be sited to the northwest of the site with ancillary buildings to the northern boundary and reinstated orchard planting would be located at the south and east sections of the site. With regards to immunity, the application is that the site is set back from the road and existing dwellings. The siting of the proposed dwelling being sufficiently distant from neighbouring properties so to alleviate concerns with regards to overlooking as a single storey dwelling. Single storey and siting ensures the dwelling would not overbear the neighbouring dwellings. However, this is not that it all that is considered in reducing visual impact in the context of the surrounding character, the volume of the building being similar to a large agricultural shed. Next building, uh, next slide, please. As previously noted, the application site is a former orchard in the past associated with Grade Two Star Hayward Lodge and a further list asset and converted buildings of architectural merit deemed non-designated heritage asset by the Council's Historic Building Officer is situated adjacent to the site. As noted by both Historic Building Officer and Historic England, the open, undeveloped nature of the site continues to contribute to the significance of Hayward Lodge and the character of the wider historic unit. The open space creates a visual separation around Hayward Lodge to emphasise its significance and status. Furthermore, the proposed design of the, historic, of the dwelling and outbuildings would diminish not only the open character of the setting, but the historic and aesthetic interest of Hayward Lodge by virtue of its design approach, referencing contemporary agricultural building. Next slide, please. This slide shows a visual from Hayward Lodge at the top, um, the bottom left showing the log from the site, and the bottom right historic mapping showing the traditional relationship between the land parcels. In accordance with paragraph 199 of the NTPF, the grade two star listed uh, listing of the house requires very great weight to be given to its conservation as it's amongst the most important of designated heritage assets. In this case, though the level of harm is considered less than substantial given the status of the neighbouring listed building and the number of nearby assets, this is afforded great weight in planning barren balance. Whilst the reinstating of orchard planting does contribute positively, as a feature it can be temporary in nature and susceptible to loss and is therefore considered unreliable in relation to the permanence of the introduction of new built form on the site. It is recognised that the visual on the slide shows some level of vegetative screening in the summer months from the application site looking towards the lodge. However, this is not exhaustive in, in assessing visual implications. The concern lies with the impact on the setting and the wider visual harm looking into onto the site. Paragraphs 200 and 202 of the MPPF are clear that any harm to listed as asset significance requires a clear and convincing justification based around the public benefits of the proposal. In the context of having a five-year housing land supply and the limited benefits of a single dwelling, 
there is not considered to be clear or convincing public benefit to outweigh, uh, outweigh the harm identified. Next slide, please. With regard to technical matters, the area engineer has raised no objection to the scheme, the proposed access being established under previous application, and the point as viewed by from the uh, road is shown in the top image. The proposed parking and towing, towing spaces are considered sufficient and support cycle parking can be included in the proposed outbuilding. Next, um, next slide, please. The proposal seeks to utilize sustainable drainage system to manage surface water and package treatment plant, the foul sewage discharge into the drainage mound. Following the publishing of the officer's report, as previously mentioned, the reconsultation of drainage engineers has been undertaken, um, concluding no objection um, with further information required uh, via condition should the application be approved. HRA was completed and sent to Natural England for consultation. No objection was raised with no adverse effects on the integrity of the River Wise Act. The application has been supported by a preliminary ecological assessment and biodiversity enhancement plan. The ecologist has considered these appropriate and relevant to the proposed development and adequate protection, avoidance, mitigation and enhancement measures could be secured by condition. Next slide, please. The top image here shows a visualisation of the proposed structure, uh, the left showing the principal... No, it's not, sorry, that's uh, the top... The top left being the visualisation, the top right being the view of the site um, from Hayward Lodge. And the bottom left image shows the view from the proposed driveway looking west into the site. And the bottom right image showing the view eastward from the site with Hayward Lodge visible above the uh, boundary. To conclude, whilst recognising that there is a wider interpretation of locations where new housing development might be supported in the neighbourhood area, as well as wider Grafton Parish, the location of the site is not one supported by either RA2 or CH9 and would undermine the spatial strategy at the time where it can be demonstrated that both the county and parish level housing supply has exceeded target growth. The conflict with the NDP spatial strategy is somewhat undermined by policy CH1, which could be interpreted to infer support for residential development in small settlements and hamlets in Grafton Parish. However, the site lies outside those small settlements and hamlets that are actually named under the paragraph 4.1.12 of the NDP. As per paragraph 199 of the uh, NPP Act, the level of harm identified is considered less than substantial and should be afforded very great weight in the planning balance given the status of Hayward Lodge and other nearby buildings of historic interest. The application has failed to provide clear and convincing justification to address the harms from the development in accordance with paragraph 200 of the NPP Act. Therefore, the proposed development would derive limited benefits in the social, economic and environmental objectives while contributing to the undersupply of self and custom build plots. However, the adverse impacts of the scheme associated with the unsustainable location and heritage impact would far outweigh the benefit, limited benefits with clear conflict with the adopted development plans in your officer's opinion. As such, it is recommended for refusal. Thank you, Mr Morgan. Uh, uh, thank you for a very thorough uh, report to the meeting. Thank you. And now we we'll move to the local member council. Sorry, oh, sorry. Uh, and now can I ask Mr Hardy from Callow and Haywood Parish Group. Mrs. Mrs. Hardy. Mr. Hardy. Mrs. Hardy, sorry, Callow and Haywood Group Parish Council. Is that okay from him? Yeah, from yes. Okay, okay. Yes, I'm a parish councillor for Callow and Haywood Parish Council. Uh, recently, our chairman um, resigned and he was due to speak. However, I, I wanted to put to you um, how we all discussed this and, and what we thought of the, this application. Um, before this application was submitted for Pippin Grange, myself and other councillors were invited to view the site, which we did, so we could appreciate exactly how this scheme would be realised. We felt that this would be beneficial if there were many supporting documents accompanying the submitted application. Parish councillors in the event unanimously voted in favour of supporting this application on the following grounds. The green credentials of this project are excellent and the applicant's vision should be applauded. 
The ecological aspect is very inspiring and the replanting of the heritage orchard trees shows respect for the historic provenance of the site. Reports from studies of the site made it clear the net ecological gain would be hugely significant. The design of the building is innovative, of an exceptional quality and meets the requirements of RA3. We felt the new development met our parish NDP as each application should be considered in the round. As a parish council, we would like to welcome more innovative self-builds on suitable sides, such as the Windfall location. Pippin Grange would be a single-story building hunkered down in the ground and would have no adverse impact on Haywood Lodge, which is well screened with established boundaries and we felt it wasn't intrusive at all. In fact, the parish council felt it was entirely sympathetic to the landscape. When I went actually to the location and had a look, it was impossible to see any um, site of Haywood Lodge at all at that point. There were no overlooking issues. The build isn't visible from the road, and we also saw evidence that Pippin Grange could not be seen from across the fields from Adams Moor. Mm -hmm. We also took into account the representations from parishioners, and at the time of deliberations when we made our decision, there were no objections, only letters of support, all from parishioners who had been Haywood Hamlet in, itself. Um, Callow and Haywood Parish Council are proud to support this application. Thank you. And now can I ask um, the, the, by the clerk to read a statement on, on behalf of Mr. Priddle, a local resident? Thank you, Chairman. This is a note from Anthony Priddle, who is an architect with a postgraduate qualification in planning, law, and systems. He lives at Haywood Lodge, which adjoined the application site. Planning disciplines. Number one, the proposal is contrary to the neighborhood plan, the core strategy, and the national planning policy framework. Number two, consent would effectively be a consent for a new house in the open country. A consent would open the floodgates for a rash of applications for new houses and in the unallocated parts of the parish and possibly the county. I can think of at least two refused sites in the parish in the last two years where the applicants would doubtless reapply on the strength of a consent on this site. Number three, why did the Parish Council elect to support the application when it was so clearly contrary to planning policies? One of the applicants is a Parish Councillor and clearly popular amongst the other Parish Councillors. Even before the design was generated, another Councillor wrote to the applicants as a friend, supporting the concept wholeheartedly, despite having had no sight of a design and presumably naive to the local, county and national planning policies. Conservation disciplines. Number four, 26 years ago, my wife and I restored Hayward Lodge, which had been badly neglected. Nikolaus he Hebsner's latest edition of highly regarded Buildings of England Herefordshire quoted Hayward Lodge, probably circa 1710, beautifully restored about 1999. Hayward Lodge is one of only two Queen Anne Grade II starred country houses in the county. It is a community heritage asset, although owned and cared for by individuals. The proposed new house would have no public benefit to counteract the damage to the Grade Two star listed building. Number six, the drive to the proposed new house runs along the complete length of the national, the, the northern boundary of Hayward Lodge and will damage the tranquility of the house and setting. Number seven, the long ridge roof light of the proposed house will adversely affect the dark sky and the setting of Hayward Lodge at night, as the site of the proposed house is on the ground elevated above the Hayward Lodge land. Other considerations. Eight, the site is not in a sustainable location. The applicants in a previous access application admitted that the family has five motor vehicles. As there is no public transport or safe pedestrian access, there will be five additional vehicles discharging onto Hayward Lane as a dangerous location. There have been 35 accidents recorded on the Hayward Lane, Callow Road in the last six years. Thank you. And now can I ask Mr. Sharp, the applicant, to speak in support of the application. You have three minutes. Thank you. I hope it was helpful to visit the site yesterday. 
and appreciate what my wife and I are trying to achieve. This is a self-built project for us, and we are lucky enough to have a unique windfall site to create a sustainable home that will probably see us out. We future-proof the house. It'll be fully accessible, single story with no stairs. Pipping Grange has as many green credentials as we could achieve with a long list of the, all the latest renewable technologies so as to live practically off grid. Central to the scheme, of course, is the reinstatement of the Heritage Orchid, which will deliver sound ecological gains and will also create an even more robust screen to Haywood Lodge, along with the boundary of trees we've already planted. We welcome many expert society who spend hours with us and our architects accessing and design, ecology, planting, etc., all detailed in the professional reports. We've been hugely disappointed that nobody from the council, particularly the planning officer or the historic officer, had ever visited the site. In 10 months, nobody came. Despite extending invitations for officers, we found out yesterday Council officers instead met with our main objectors at their Haywood Lodge home, fully engaged with them about our planning application. Sadly, nobody extended the same courtesy to us as the applicants. We question how officers can reach a sound recommendation to refuse permission when they have not even visited the site. This is particularly disheartening as we have commissioned experts in their fields to provide fully informed evidence, experts whose offers for dialogue with the council counterparts went unanswered. Of course, there'll be concerns about heritage. However, our specialist consultant spent hours considering the setting on site, then revisited the plans to ensure architects fully responded to initial assessments for a positive evolution. Every element was carefully considered. However, when we tried to engage with the planning department with regard to the heritage concerns of their current rejection of RA3 element of the scheme, still there has been no clarification or direction. The Parish Council unanimously supported this sustainable self-built project and said it should be celebrated and applauded. Even though councillors considered the application in the round, much has been made of policy CH9 of the NDP. It is now accepted that the Parish Council interprets their own policy differently to the county. The Chairman of the Parish Council resigned on Friday night over this issue after he was told he could not give his views here. In any event, Pipping Grange not only accords to the NDP, but also achieves RA3 status, and it's clearly an inspiring design of exceptional quality and achieves sustainable standards of design and construction. I hope you too will support this thoroughly green, environmentally friendly, ecologically sound, self-build application. Thank you. Thank you. If you could now take your sins back. <laughs> I now ask the local member is Councillor Balderson. I'd now like her to introduce the debate and make her statement now. You have 10 minutes, Councillor. Thank you, Chair. So one of my main roles as Ward Councillor is to represent the public up in my communities. And normally I find this to be a relatively straightforward process. However, in this case, I live in the parish, the applicant lives in the parish, uh, the main objector lives within the parish, and the applicant and the main objector are also both parish councillors. And as a result of several recent events, the parish council is currently without a chair or a full-time clerk. So as a result, I will use my time to provide a background on the representation submitted. In addition to the applicants and individuals living at Roman Bar, there were, were a further 19 representations supporting the application, which I've included in my address, one of which was posted online this morning. These represented seven residences within the parish, the parish council, and six other residents who live outside the parish or whose residence was unknown. Given the size of the parish, I would consider this to be significant representation. There were nine representations not supporting the application, of which five residences were within the parish, along with four individuals who live outside the parish, and there was one general comment from outside the parish. The main topics within the representations surround the eco-sustainable features of the application, policy arguments around RA3 and the NDP, conservation considerations and highway concerns. The application is for a single story metal clad farm building together with the ancillary buildings replicating the old agricultural buildings that were once part of the working farm. 
it is undeniable that there are a number of eco-sustainable features in the applicant's design, such as the high standard of insulation, air heat exchange, solar panels, its own water supply, and sustainable waste treatment, giving it a low carbon footprint. We unfortunately do not see these features in many applications or committees, as echoed by my previous work, uh, colleague in, in a previous application. Um, <clears throat> The, in, in the representation, there were also, they highlighted new designs that had been approved across the country, integrating new developments within historical settings. Representations acknowledged an application of our, um, acknowledged an appreciation of our history and heritage conservation, but could not understand why developments such as this one could not live side by side. They also encouraged the idea outlined within the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs Roadmap of May 21 that we are the custodians of our land for the next generation, and that we can become the first generation to leave the environment in a better state than what we found it. Beauty is certainly in the eye of the beholder and design is subjective. However, the applicants supported by all the other residents in the hamlet with the exception of Hayward Lodge, believe that this is an innovative and outstanding scheme and one that would meet the criteria of RA3. That is, it is a design of exceptional quality. Clause 80 of the current MPPF describes an innovative and outstanding scheme to be truly outstanding, reflecting the higher standards in architecture and would help to raise standards of design more generally in rural areas, and one that would significantly enhance its immediate setting and be sensitive to the defining characteristics of the local area. In contrast, the objecting residents believe the land is open countryside and that this application falls well short of all the exemplary tests contained within RA3 and Clause 80 of the current MPPF, and therefore it can contravene the policies within the core strategy, local plan, and NDP. In relation to the NDP, Section 4.5 and CH9 address housing. Objectors outline that the NDP directs local new housings within or further to the second tier settlement of Grafton. And as the application site is approximately one and a half kilometers from the center of the Grafton Hamlet, it is not one of the settlement areas for development. CH9 specifically states that new housing proposals will be supported in both within or adjacent to the settlement of Grafton. It goes on to say that new housing should be located on small infill plots within or adjacent to existing clusters or buildings or built up areas of Grafton wherever possible. Representations highlight that at least two other applications have been reviewed in the area on the same grounds. These objections are consistent with the officer's report. And it was confirmed yesterday at the site visit that the land is not infill but indeed backfill and is agricultural in nature, being a form of orchard. It is not part of the recognized garden curtilage for the buyer. Supporters outline that the old heritage orchard on site was always a thriving ecological sanctuary, but over the decades since the land was split up and sold, the site has become bleak and bare. And the proposed scheme, including reinstatement of a historical orchard, would be beneficial together with the countless wildlife gains. Many report the field as garden wasteland and would be benefited from sympathetic redevelopment and is far away from Hayward Lodge, not to cause any realistic harm and is hidden from view. <clears throat> Excuse me. Supporters have also highlighted that CH9 can be interpreted differently. That is, the housing should be adjacent to existing clusters of buildings or built up areas of Grafton wherever possible, which potentially opens the doors to other areas as identified in paragraph 1.3 of the NDP, where the population is concentrated in small hamlets and village and small villages around Bullinghope, Grafton to the north, Twyford Common to the east, and Callow, Haywood, and Ducal Court to the south. I believe that the application site would be considered to be part of the Haywood hamlet. Which leads me on to the Conservation Court and Haywood Lodge, which is one of only two listed grade two Queen Anne country houses in Hertfordshire. The property has been restored over the last 20 years by the current owners, with photos of, of before and after included in their representations. Representations online outline that the Historic England Advisor has highlighted how the removal of buildings between Haywood Lodge Roman buyer has restored an important sense of openness to the lodge. Objectors outline that the sitting design and materials of the proposal would be detrimental to the setting and perceived history and character, 
of the Grade Two star listed Haywood Lodge and its historic heritage. The harm caused to this community heritage asset would not be outweighed by any significant public benefits. The representation by the owners of Haywood Lodge also outlines that the Deborah Historic Orchards Map and Natural England's Traditional Orchards Database show that all the orchards close to Haywood Lodge should be categorized as definitely traditional orchards primary habitat. As this unusually large group of orchards were related to the farming activity centered on the lodge, they form part of its history and relevant setting as a listed building. The historic integrity of this group of orchards would be undermined by placing a new house amongst these orchard fields. It was also identified that the proposed drive will be particularly intrusive and will be visible down the complete northern boundary of Haywood Lodge. It will separate the lodge from the first era of farm buildings established after enclosure of agriculture and will damage the settings with noise and lights. The hedge along this boundary is very open in the winter months, so at times affords little screening. The applicant has already taken action to try and remedy this by planting 140 corn beam along the hedge, which you saw yesterday when you were inside. When the application for the driveway was refused by Herefordshire Council, the applicants took it to appeal. The appeal inspector in paragraph seven of his report indicated that based on historic mapping, there would have been a distinction between the formal lodge and the working farmstead, which includes the appeal site, with some land features featured providing formal links between the two sites. However, Haywood Lodge now functions as an independent dwelling and is physically separated by boundary treatments from the appeal site. The latter is also occupied by non-agricultural uses. In addition, common land features between these two sites have been largely eroded. Supporters of the application also highlighted that the planning was granted for the Southern Link Road, despite the negative impact of the road on the historical environment of Cable Lodge. Lastly, although there is prior approval for a second entrance on the highway, Haywood Lane is notorious for significant amounts of speeding traffic. Objectors to this application believe that a four bed dwelling will generate a considerable number of new car journeys, particularly in this Amazon delivery era. This will be exacerbated by the unsustainable location of the application as it lacks public transport and other facilities, making residents heavily dependent on the car. The applicants and their family are extremely passionate about their environment and the credentials of the scheme they have put forward. They are 100% convinced that you should approve this planning application and they have the support of the parish council and influences within their hamlet, with the exception of Haywood Lodge. On the contrary, the owners of Haywood Lodge are equally passionate about the history and character of their grade two star listed Queen Anne property and the open nature of the land and orchards of its historic heritage, and don't believe that the application accords with the core strategy, local plan, or NDP. They are also 100% convinced that you should agree with the planning officer's recommendation and reject this application. So I now leave for you all to think. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bones. We'll at the end of it. Councillor Bowen. Uh, th thank you very much, Joe. And thank you to Councillor Wilson and to our planning officer, too, uh, for a very substantial and I think evenly balanced report, well balanced. Um, yes, I think some of the remarks by our listed building officer in particular as to the importance and significance of Hayward Lodge are very, very germane to this particular matter. It is a beautiful building. Um, very special, I think. And the setting also is very important to it. And you may say it's being screened at the moment, but when the leaves come off, the screening goes with the leaves, I'm afraid. And that is one of those things we have to accept. So the screening is only for partial to part of the year. And the rest of the year, it is very exposed indeed to any a new building being put up into the, in the field adjacent to it. And yes, it's good to think it might be uh, having new orchard in there on the interesting, what might be well, medieval bridge and furrow pasture there, um, which didn't get mentioned, but it would appear to be so. And I'm sure uh, my fellow councillor Miller will agree with me on that. Uh, it's, he's not being held to that, by the way, <laughs> but he, he is very expert in these things. Um, it's very, very heavy clay, too. Uh, the soil there, so I'm worried about percolation and all the rest of it, and how the how the foul water might be uh, well managed. 
I have, I have to, to figure that. Yes, it is a very innovative and unusual building, um, but I would say it is not like a, a palm building that would have been contemporary with the with Haywood Lodge itself. More, moreover, it is much more like a very modern industrial building and would look well on an industrial estate and would be very much at home there. But I do not think it is very suitable as a new house and open countryside right next door to a very important list of building. And I would certainly propose that we oppose this um, application. Sorry, I'll second that. You seconded it, uh, Councillor Melbourne. Uh, Councillor Watson. Um, uh, thank you. Um, I also just wanted to actually congratulate the um, applicant for a really fantastic um, you know, eco designed home. Um, but I also unfortunately have to agree with Councillor Bowen in the sense that. And I support officer recommendation because it does extend the boundary, and it, it um, and it's just so ironic, isn't it? In planning, when we get the right place, right house, but it's in the wrong place, um, and that's the tragedy about this application, I think. Um, and I just want to ask Elsie, um, um, is that is it that there was no pre-application? Um, sort, you know, so from what I picked up on the report, that there was no pre-app done? Um, there, there was no pre-app then. I think it, it was picked up in the HBO comments, I believe. Yeah. Um, obviously, it's a helpful route to go down just in terms of being able to guide applications before they come forward, but it's had no bearing on the outcome of the specific application. No, I understand that. I think that that's that pre-app is really, um, you know, so valuable for any applicant, um, you know, to have those early conversations um, uh, make it, you know, um, a step to the line, say so. So thank you. I, I support um, and your uh, officer's recommendation. Can I just go to Councillor Milmore? Yeah. Yeah. I, I just want to say why I second that, because I've got in my notes here, when I saw that picture, I just jotted down ugly chicken shed. And I, I know it's subjective, but it, that's what it came across to me as. Uh, it made me have very innovative, innovative um, designs in terms of um, technology or whatever, but it's packaged in something which is, I think, is, is uh, unsuitable to be next to that uh, Green Ant building. Councillor <laughs> uh, Norman next. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to both the um, officer and to board member for enlightening us and giving us the detail behind all this, because it is complex and it is a difficult one. Um, for me, uh, if we're going to go against the, um, you know, the, the rule against build in open country, there has to be a very, very good reason for it. And although I, like others, really applaud the sustainability features of this building, wonderful to hear about the, you know, the um, low energy um, uh, designs and so on. I can't help agreeing with uh, the previous speaker about the actual visual picture of it does not appeal at all to me. That is very, very subjective. Of course, it's it's personal, but it doesn't to me seem to be something that we would want to uh, see um, and applaud visually at all. So I, I do have concern about that. And then, of course, um, in contrast with the sustainability of the building itself, we have the dilemma of increased traffic on a very busy road, apparently, the fact that you almost certainly have to travel by car to get to any services whatsoever. So we're adding to the, um, you know, to the problem that's there to start with. Um, and one of the reasons why we don't encourage countryside building is it, because of that very, you would have to travel uh, by car and, and add to the problems that that would lead to. And then finally, there is this business about buildings and, um, you know, the impact this might have on at least one very fine building in the area. I believe there were a number of others as well, but this is one in particular. Um, so I also, um, uh, in spite of the positive aspect of it, do not feel able to support this application and will be supporting the officer recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Fox. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
The proposed application for Pipping Grange and auxiliary outbuildings are in an area surrounded by historic buildings. Some existing buildings are grade two listed, whilst others are historic farm buildings and cottages of sufficient architectural merit to be given a non-designated heritage asset status. I believe the proposed buildings do not enhance and complement the historic buildings, but tend to look more like industrial factory buildings. Policy CH9 indicates new housing should be small infill plots with existing clusters of buildings. And I fear the proposed development in this application tends to dominate the landscape. So, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Andrew. <clears throat> thank you. If I could reduce it to minimum, this is basically a new dwelling in open countryside, and as such, I think it should be refused. Thank you. Councillor Ray. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Chair. As usual, I just make notes. Um, development in open countryside, contrary to um, Carlo Hayward number nine and four, <laughs> not sustainable development. There's no footpath, there's no um, shop, no school, no bus. Affecting the status of a grade two star listed building, I've also put down wonderful idea, wrong place. Uh, does this application enhance the immediate vicinity, especially regarding its very close proximity to listed buildings? The answer is no. So, therefore, I'll be voting with officer recommendations on this point. Are there any other contributions? Councillor Mill, sorry. Uh, uh, thank you. I just wanted to ask for a bit of clarification from the planning case officer and uh, for the interpretation of policy RA3, which is which is the one about housing in the open countryside and how, how we make exceptions to the normal rules. And, uh, uh, because clearly there is a difference of view between the applicant and your good self, and it's a, it's um, it's around the 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 sustainability features, the innovative features, and in uh, the uh, core strategy, which references the NPPF paragraph fifty five, as it then was at that time, that word innovative was in there. However, the current NPPF equivalent paragraph, which is eighty. That word innovative is not in there. So, do we re relate to paragraph 55 in the MPPF as it was at the time RA3 was drafted, when in, in, in the word innovative was there? Or do we relate to paragraph 80 in the MPPF as it is now, when in, innovative is not there? Thank you, Councillor Young. Um, I think it's logical to. Um, that planning policy updates and we would refer to how it um, how it reads now being paragraph 80 to include it includes um, sustainability and um, outstanding design. Yes. Sorry, Chairman. It doesn't actually just as truly outstanding, uh, exceptional quality in, in that it is truly outstanding, reflecting the highest standards of architecture and would help raise standards of design more generally in rural areas. It doesn't doesn't uh, the word sustainability and innovative are not there. Uh, in the in the current iteration. So my my question is, are we are we basing our judgment on the current iteration or the iteration of the NPPF as it is referenced in our course strategy? It is as per the the latest policy document you have in front of you, which is the NPPF. Yeah. Uh, the current one. Okay. Thank you. That's, that's uh, the current okay. legal office. I'm sorry. Yeah, just for clarification, for the avoidance of any doubts, we have to go with the latest policy. So Section 80 now trumps what was happening back um, post um, June 2019, that's when the policy came. So um, if the planning officer is relying on this, the paragraph 80 under the existing uh, MPPF and her planning judgment is correlating to that, then that would be the right position. So is that is that the case that that's what's yeah, taking that's, place? That is the case. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other speakers? 
Mr. Bishop, do you want to move on? Case officers. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the members have had a good debate on this on this application. They picked out the, um, the various aspects to the proposal that, uh, in particular, the the um, uh, the NDP and uh, where you have the, that difference of, um, of of where development should take um, should take place, etc., and the name settlements, etc. That's all. Um, you picked up that. You've also picked up the impact on the. Uh, heritage assets and the access, etc., um, and uh, are more content for the members to progress with their um, yeah with, with their vote. Thank you, Chair. Mm -hmm. Then we'll go to the local member to finally sum up. Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you to those that um, commented uh, in the debate. I know the applicants will be extremely disappointed um, with the outcome. Um, they have had previous applications which weren't approved by Hedge Council and it did go to appeal. So I expect um, this one would follow in a very similar manner because they are extremely passionate about um, their build uh, and, and the eco qualities that, that it um, provides. But thank you very much for the debate today. Thank you. We have a proposer and seconder for the recommendation as outlined in the, in, in the agenda. Can I ask for those in favor of the recommendation? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve in favor. Those against? One. Abstentions? One. One. Then that uh, the resolution is carried. Can we now move on to the final item on our agenda? <laughs> All right, that would be impressive for a five minute paper this time. Since the local member has got it, getting here. Um, we have a statement from which the clerk will read out unless we can we get him through through our online. So we don't seem to be able to at the moment. Um, can I announce the um, speakers? Um, Ms. Conard and Mr. Kirby. Um, and uh, Mr. Smythe um, is speaking on Zoom. So he's in the meeting. He's in the, me he's in the meeting online. Yeah. We just can I? Uh, the speaker is present to take a deep Thank you, Chair. Now I'll ask Mr. Banks to make the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good morning, members. Uh, first of all, thank you to those of you who attended the site visit uh, yesterday morning. I hope you found that useful and informative. Um, so we'll crack on with the presentation. Um, as you'll be aware, the application is uh, full planning permission for the erection of six dwellings and associated access to the site. So the site lies to the northeast of Erdsland and is accessed off the B. 4529, which is the main route through the village. And you can see from the slides that the site is marked by the Red Star. Go the next slide, please. Thank you. So the site's broadly rectangular in shape, as you can see again from the slide here, outlined in red. It is essentially flat, and it's raised slightly above the road level by, I would say, between 0.3 and 0.5 metre. <laughs> Currently in agricultural use, um, with an access existing, uh, providing access to the field in the bottom right hand corner of the site. Properties bound the site to the north and the west, and it's located just outside of the 30 mile an hour speed restriction zone. As members will have seen when they attended the site visit yesterday, this is clearly defined by a gateway feature of picket fencing and planters on either side of the road. Next slide, please. So as you can see from the two photographs here um, in the top left, uh, it's a view along the, the B road and you can see the, the gateway feature and the planters in the distance. And then the bottom slide is a view across the site from the point of access. Next slide. Um, as I said, by way of introduction, the proposal is for six. <laughs> Uh, these are a combination of one two-bed, three three-bed, and two four-bed units. Uh, the plans on the screen, or the plan on the screen at the moment, shows the proposed layouts. 
you'll see that the existing point of access into the field is to be utilised with a shared driveway serving all six of the properties. They are orientated in a linear fashion at 90 degrees to the public highway with a terrace of three closest to the road. Uh, the terrace shares uh, a courtyard parking area to the rear uh, and we'll have a look at that in a little bit more detail in a minute. Um, the plans also show a packaged treatment plant within the curtilage of plot four and a drainage mound in the northwesternmost corner of the site, which is within the curtilage of plot six. Next slide, please. So these following five slides show the proposed elevations of the, and floor plans of the dwellings. This first one shows the floor plan for the terrace, uh, and as I said, this comprises one two bed and two three bed dwellings. Um, you'll see that there's a blank area midway along the ground floor, uh, uh, the ground floor plan. This provides the means of access to the rear parking area. Next slide. So in terms of elevational treatments, these appear um, as an arched cart entrance with accommodation over. The plans show a cottage style uh, range of one and a half storeys with dormer windows with a mix of timber frame, brick and rendered finishes for external materials. Next slide, please. Plot four is a detached three bed dwelling with its own detached garage. And again, is a mix of timber frame and render. Next slide. Plot five is also shown as, but uh, you'll see that there's an office shown on the first floor. So in reality, I think that's probably not more likely to be a property. It's a combination of timber frame with timber boarding. Um, the property has an attached garage and the elevations are the only ones to indicate the installation of some panels and a ground source of heat. Next slide, please. Finally, plot six, which is again uh, a similar mix of external facing materials. It's a four bedroom property with a detached garage. Uh, next slide again, thank you. So the following slide is an extract from the Erzland NDP and is the policies map. For the <coughs> it's a useful starting point as it clearly identifies many of the key constraints that are relevant to this particular proposal. As far as the principle of development is concerned, policy RA2 of the core strategy and E9 both accept that development may occur within or adjacent to the settlement. And this is a, an important um, aspect of this proposal. Um, if you'll see the black line uh, on the plan um, that identifies the settlement boundary for the village, and you'll see that the site is clearly adjacent to, but not within the settlement boundary. So the principle of residential development is not something that officers have a fundamental um, objection to. Um, we broadly think that it's policy compliant in that regard. But you will note that the scheme is considered to fail on other grounds, which are reflected in the five reasons for refusal. So I'll deal with the first reason for refusal last, if I may, um, and we'll initially consider the second and third reasons in combination. Again, just looking at this plan very briefly, you'll see that the red line, which is drawn more widely around the village than the settlement boundary, shows the conservation area boundary. See, so it's a red line and it's got um, sort of hatching around it. It can't be colored like. No. I see it that it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's this line here. Yeah. <laughs> Come with the next slide, please. So those members that attended the site visit yesterday will have seen and uh, be familiar with uh, these two photos. The approach to the village is rural in character as you can see from the photographs. Historically, development has taken a linear form along the roadside before assuming greater depth towards the centre of the village. Policy E1 of the NDP requires that development should not have a detrimental impact on protected views of the village. However, the site is located within one of the protected views, which was protected view one identified by the NDP. 
uh, and members might like to just take a quick look at paragraph 6.12 and 6.13 and you'll see that there's a diagrammatic representation of that uh, viewpoint. Also, it's considered that the development will erode the character that policy E1 seeks to protect by introducing development in depth, something which is entirely contrary to the development pattern in this locality. The proposal is not influenced positively by the landscape or townscape, as policy LD1 of the core strategy requires. In fact, officers' views are that it's entirely at odds with it. In terms of the historic environment, much of the same applies. Policy LD4 of the core strategy, ED, uh, E2 of the NDP, and the, ND, the NPPF all have broad intentions of preserving or enhancing the character and setting of heritage assets, which in this case specifically is the conservation area. The comments of the historic buildings officer are quite clear about the effect of introducing development that is perpendicular to the road. It's entirely contrary to the established settlement pattern, as I've said before, and whilst causing less than substantial harm to the significance of the, her the heritage assets, the harm is not considered to be outweighed by any demonstrable public benefits. Next slide, please. Turning now relating to matters of highway safety, um, members again that were able to attend the site visit will be familiar with the situation shown in these two photographs. The site's not well connected in terms of footpath provision. Where it does exist, it's very narrow, and you can see that um, from the bottom photograph there, which is a photograph taken uh, on the bridge of the River Arrow. Otherwise, pedestrians are only prote protected by the white line on the outside edge of the carriageway or the roadside verge. Um, I would, at this point, like to refer members to the update sheet, um, which advises about um, a proposed alternative access that the agent had shown. Uh, if you have a look at paragraph 6.36, you'll see um, the root of that alternative footpath arrangement. Um, this relies on private um, and it's not been agreed with the landowner, and therefore is not a viable option. Um, so, as far as that is concerned, I, I would recommend that you disregard that in your assessment of the proposal on highway safety grounds. So no new footpath improvements are shown, nor is any agreement in place to secure them if planning permission were to be granted. The transport statement submitted with the application shows that traffic speeds are well in excess of the 30 mile an hour speed limit. The council's highway engineer is objected to the application on grounds relating to pedestrian safety, a member's attention is drawn to paragraph 6.37 in terms of the priorities the development should give to pedestrians within schemes and also within their surrounding areas. The scheme fails to ensure the safety of pedestrians and officers' view is this is contrary to policy NT1 of the core strategy and NPPF. Next slide, please. Those of you that are familiar with Erzenham will know that the River Arrow is quite a dominant feature within the village. Uh, it's integral to its character and beauty and also to its historical context. Next slide. It also represents a significant constraint in terms of considering where to place new development. Now, the light blue areas that you can see on the plan are all areas that are liable to flood. Um, so for Councillor Millmore's benefit, <laughs> you can see the areas all the way around the big side of the village and then large areas on the other as well. That's right, I'm not colored by blue. <laughs> <laughs> this way they can read <laughs> so the village has a long history uh, of flood events, uh, as Councillor Phillips advised uh, members when we did the site visit yesterday. Um, and during this period, the, the events take place obviously during periods of heavy, heavy rainfall. Um, whilst the Environment Agency have withdrawn their original objection on flood risk grounds, the flood risk assessment submitted with the application accepts there is a history um, of the highway that bounds the site being flooded. The Council's Emergency Planning Officer is not persuaded by the issue, um, that, sorry, that the issue of safe access in a flood event uh, is addressed. 
And I would draw members' attention to the comment at paragraph 4.6. So again, just drawing your attention to the updates, um, you'll see um, that the applicant's agent has provided a response to the five reasons for refusal. And, uh, and as far as um, reason four is concerned, they suggested that um, the emergency planning officer doesn't in fact object to the application, but has suggested that the matter could be dealt with by condition. I think I would caveat that a little bit. I think my interpretation of the comments aren't that they are particularly positive about the proposal and they do note quite specifically the absence um, of an emergency evacuation plan. So the comments that they've made aren't really a tacit agreement that the proposal is acceptable. Um, and again, members who attended the site visit were advised about um, the submergence of the highway in flood events. Uh, and as I said, there is quite a noticeable difference between the level of the highway and the actual site itself. So in the absence of an acceptable emergency plan, officers take the view that the proposal is contrary to policy in this particular regard. So finally, returning to the first reason for refusal, um, members of this committee will be well versed with the situation regarding water quality and the failing status in terms of phosphate targets within the River Lux of catchment at the River Wise Sack. And this particular refusal reason deals with this specifically. <coughs> if the committee comes to a different conclusion to its officers in respect of the four other reasons for refusal, the failure of the application to demonstrate nutrient neutrality or betterment means that the application can't be determined positively today. In this scenario, a resolution to approve subject to nutrient neutrality or better being demonstrated should be made. To achieve this would most likely require the applicants to engage in the council's phosphate credit system. So in conclusion, officers have taken the view that the less than substantial harm to the significance of earth and conservation area as an important her heritage asset is not outweighed by the public benefits that might be accrued from permitting the development. Clear concerns around highway safety and emergency planning have been identified, and at this point in time are unresolved. Notwithstanding all of this, the proposal has failed to demonstrate nutrient neutrality or betterment, and officers have therefore concluded that the proposal will have a likely significant effect on water quality within the river love catchment. And therefore, as I've said before, the application cannot be positively determined, even if other material planning considerations are deemed to be acceptable. And it's on this basis that the application is recommended for a few. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Banks. And now can I ask Ms. Connor from the Parish Council? Sorry. My jaw isn't working properly. <laughs> to, on behalf of Ersley Parish Council make her presentation. You have three minutes. Okay. So we're Ursula and Parish Council. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today, representing the views of our parishioners. We find that we have to unanimously, unanimously object to the planning application put forward for the following reasons. As the application site is part of a functional flood plain, there is a very serious real flood risk to the occupants of the proposed new development and the existing houses. Although requested, there is no evacuation plan apparent in the event of flooding. And we know from local knowledge and evidence that the road into Ursland and therefore access and egress from the proposed site becomes impassable. This is from both ends of the village, thus removing villages. There is a proposed suggestion of the houses having a lifted elevation to bring them above the height of the flooding to which there are no supported drawings. The site is adjacent to the Ursland conservation area and we were saddened to see the burning of a mature oak early on a Saturday morning immediately prior to the planning application being lodged. On submitted plans to date, there are no ecology, biodiversity or geodiversity mitigations to which as a parish we are very passionate about and the biodiversity loss that has already occurred has been keenly felt. We should be enhancing and protecting our landscape and our dark sky policy. Within our NDP, we have noted the importance of protecting the impact on the heritage, visual and landscape aspects and this proposed amendment would seek to urbanise the rural setting with the designs not in keeping with the local architecture and the same designs used by the agent on many occasions. 
the protected aspect view into the village from Leinster, the east, would also be lost, which is protected in our NDP. Highway safety is still a huge concern for our parish, and there seems to be a refusal from the developer to implement the recommended <laughs> extension of the 30 mile an hour speed limit. Our own community speed watch have recorded speeds over 50 mile an hour into the village directly past this development. And again, they've been out this morning, but we've also had the same speeds. There is no designated safe pedestrian access or link route into the village with the latest route suggested, as the officer said, over private land, of which the developer who actually resides in Ireland would have been fully aware of this. Therefore, highway safety for vulnerable road users is still not addressed. As a riverside village, we are highly aware of concerns regarding phosphate pollution and are surprised to see no mitigation proposal being put forward by the applicant for this. Alongside this, there are concerns on the stormwater of six houses and the associated hard standing having an impact on the delicately balanced infrastructure, which is easily stressed. In conclusion, the planning as such is not compliant with our NDP in many respects, and we've tried to liaise with the developer on several occasions, but to no avail. The NDP we refer to in every planning application that is received with the parish and is used to protect our parish heritage, visual impact and landscape interest alongside the characteristics of our village. We have discussed this application on numerous occasions at parish council meetings and addressed the points raised when a new document or information has been uploaded onto the planning portal. The development causes unavoidable adverse impacts on numerous levels to our parish and hope the committee can sense the strength of local feeling towards the application. But we do thank the officer for their obvious time spent on the detailed report and are heartened to see that our concerns have been addressed. Thank you. That's gone on a little over time. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Forgive me. Um, and now, can I invite uh, Mr. Kirby, who, uh, a local resident, to speak in objection to the planning application? Thank you. I'm here today to represent the parishioners of Edsland who submitted objections to this planning application and seek the refusal of the proposal. I've lived in Edsland for 26 years and know the NDP and the flood situation locally well. Many facets of this application are a concern. Most are well described in the officer's report. I would wish to emphasize four of the main concerns. The land in question is designated for agricultural use. It sits outside of the settlement boundary, is adjacent to the conservation area and until current ownership was a highly productive piece of land. The rich biodiversity of the land has been significantly degraded recently by deep ploughing and the felling of a mature oak tree, of which you've heard, both of which happened just prior to the submission of the planning application. The land sits in the floodplain of the River Arrow, mostly in flood zone three. When flooding occurs, the land in question is bounded by floodwaters on all sides. Then access to the field is not possible. Also, the southern end of this field can be inundated with water from the Arrow, which comes by the nearby Caravan Park, Lime Lane, and land to the northwest. The field provides a small but important area which assists in the absorption of excess water. The objection to building on this land is intended to help protect residents and existing properties from flooding. In the last major flood event in the village, 24 properties were flooded and the community effectively paralyzed. Our third point, this application fails to take any account of the majority of the relevant provisions concerning housing development contained in our NDP, and as such runs against the wishes of the majority of the residents of the parish. After consultation and ballot, 86% voted in favour of adopting our NDP. One of the core objectives of the NDP was to stop development which would see building on the floodplain, or which was likely to exacerbate flood risks elsewhere. We already face one of the most extreme flood risks in Herefordshire, and climate change can only make this situation worse. It's worth noting that in this case, over 60 residents submitted formal objections. My final point, the officer's report highlights the many areas where the proposal fails to satisfy national, county or local provisions. Most significant are the issues surrounding foul water management and the likely pollution of adjacent properties and the arrow. 
Seven properties with drainage fields are located within 150 metres and two within 13 metres of this field. The site is specifically identified with the NDP to be preserved and protected as the eastern approach to an historic black and white village. In conclusion, I ask that our objections be upheld and the application be refused. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Good. And now, if uh, Mr. Smythe, uh, speaking on behalf of the applicant, please can. <coughs> Mr. Smythe. Yes, can you see me? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's common ground that in principle, it's acceptable to develop the site for housing, given its location adjacent to the village. So the question really for the committee is whether the problems or shortcomings identified by the officer um, are so potent to render the site unacceptable. Um, I won't address you on the second and third um, proposed reasons for refusal because you're um, members have done a site visit and you're in a good position to judge that impact. So if I can just deal with the three technical objections. Um, firstly, in respect to the first reason for refusal, as I understand it, Welsh Water are now satisfied with the arrangement and there's no objection from the Environment Agency. And so this issue is capable of being overcome and controlled <laughs> by condition. Um, that's a tough means for the council to monitor the site like a hawk and ensure that the applicant does what he says he will do. And if the applicant can't or doesn't, then the council of course can refuse to discharge the condition. Um, I say the solution here is utterly unremarkable. Um, I'm told that none of the houses in the village are connected to public foul drainage. All the existing homes rely upon septic tank or package treatment plant with soakaways. So what's source of the goose, um, source of the gander, uh, penultimately dealing with the fourth reason for refusal, it's common ground that the access to the site is safe and fully compliant with government guidance and policy. The simple residual concern boils down to the fact there is no pavement to the village. Um, I say that is an unremarkable arrangement for a rural area. There's no history of accidents in the vicinity of the site. Um, and that what is proposed here for a modest number of housing houses is entirely sound and proportionate and it would be unrealistic to expect the applicant to provide a pavement, but the applicant does um, um, offer to restore the part of the grass third which has become overrun on the south side of the road. And finally, dealing with the fifth reason for refusal, um, all the houses are in flood zone one. The Environment Agency has withdrawn its objection. The emergency planning officer does not object and he is satisfied the matter can be dealt with by condition requiring a flood evacuation management plan. The, count, the applicant is happy to provide that. Effectively, the dispute with the officer boils down to the fact the officer wants the draft plan now rather than it being dealt with by condition um, in the future. Um, and the applicant says that is not necessary. There's no magic in the flood plan. It says things which will be familiar to members, things like the existing householders giving their emergency telephone numbers to the council, um, agreeing not to block the access, or the new householders knowing where the nearest exits are. They're the sorts of issues which are commonly dealt with in a management plan, and it's common and unremarkable for that matter to be dealt with by condition. And that's I'm why afraid, I you. Sorry. Mr. Spy, we've gone over your time. Yeah, forgive me. Sorry. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. We now, unfortunately, but I don't think we've been able to make contact with Councillor Phillips, but he has got a brief statement. I think he sent by email. Yes, indeed. Uh, oh, yes. Can the public speakers please go back? Mm -hmm. Body of A uh, comment from ward member. My apologies for not attending. I have a water leak in my house um, and awaiting Welsh water. <laughs> Can I thank the members for attending the site visit yesterday, which I hope they found useful. I think it was useful to properly evaluate the siting, level, situation, approach and connectivity to the village of Erzlan. The matter has been referred to the planning committee due to the large number of comments and objections from the community. As the village and surrounds are in a floodplain, 
with a high water table and no main sewage system, it would be useful to establish a policy determination of the planning authority. That's Roger Phillips. Councillor mm -hmm. Bowen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my ward is adjacent to uh, Mr. Philip, Councillor Phillips' ward. Mm -hmm. A little bit of Erdison is in my ward already. Uh, I know this area well. I've seen it in full flood, and it is very impressive. If a little worrying, if you have been living there. So I would be very cautious about decrying the power of, of the floods at all. It is, it is seriously bad news if you're trying to get, get around the place, trying to escape or get into the village when you've got heavy flooding. Uh, and I don't think this, this application really uh, deals with that problem properly at all. Uh, I know the entrance into the village from the visual point of view as, as well. And I think a slab of housing perpendicular to the road will be detrimental to the views into the village, which are considered important. And I would consider them very important. Uh, it is a one of our key classic timber frame villages in Herefordshire. It is a gem, but it can be a dangerous gem when the floods are about. Uh, I don't think the, uh, the access or egress in times of emergency have been addressed at all. And I don't think you can just do that by condition and say, oh, it'll be fine, never mind. You can just bring each other up and say, have you got any bread or wine or whatever? Um, Notice your priority. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Not allowed to drink milk. <laughs> Uh, and I'm concerned about the, the drainage too, the power drainage. Uh, and to have a, a system where one house has the pumping system, another house has the drainage mound, it seems bizarre. I mean, what sort of system is that? And how are you going to manage it? And who's going to be owning it and maintaining it? And the thought of having more possible power and water in in the area of the flooding is very bad. It's not of that happening because as we've heard, uh, all the residences have their own cesspits and such. And uh, I think it's just it's it's, it's a it's a dodgy dodgy prospect, I think, put it in this as you might say in more news. It is rather a suburban outlook they're trying to promote here. And I think that is very anti Village. It is not as a bad village at all. It is very much a, a wonderfully diverse and, shall we say, special village. And this doesn't add in any way to its stories. And it is far too, far too, I don't know, it is far too suburban. Uh, and it is not in any way, I think, a benefit in the prospect. I'm sorry about that, but there it is. And as for the traffic, yes, I've seen traffic speeding along there, and they certainly managed to walk along there between 40 and 50 miles an hour. No problem. Can I just also say, it's a pleasure to see Mr. Banks back on duty again, the front bench. <laughs> so I would propose refusal of this application. Is there a second for that? In a uh, yes, can I just just say we often get planning applications, and when we come to consider them, there are considerable representation based on the flooding in various villages throughout the throughout the county. But there is no village that is more prone to flood uh, flooding. It is. Um, I, I can't think of anywhere in the county that floods as much as this. Indeed, I. I got stuck in it um, some years ago, not very far from the entrance to this particular building. Anyway, that's very good. That's very, sorry, that's very, but um, anyway, we've taken communion with you and we'll go on to kind of say nothing <laughs> <once. laughs> away from it. Right? <laughs> Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I don't think I can be as eloquent as uh, Councillor Bowen, but um, I support his um, concerns. And I just want to ask uh, the, the officer just one question. Um, before I make another statement, is that did this go through pre API? Um, was there any pre app advice on this application? As far as I'm aware, no, there wasn't. Okay, um, I might be wrong, but I'm not aware. Okay, for me, it's because there are 
the Clerk Council is objective. There are 69 public members of the public objecting and off key officers have object, objected. And so I support Councillor Bowen's and I support officers' recommendation. Thank you, boss. Thank you, Chair. Aesthetically, the design and layout of the six dwellings looks interesting and I like it, but I believe it's in the wrong location. Looking at the map, the sheer size of the development would dominate the village. Erdis Land is a stunningly beautiful, historic black and white village, attracting tourists and visitors who like to step back in time and follow the very well-known black and white villages trail. I fear the cul-de-sac arrangement of the development would detract from the historic beauty of the village. First impressions should never be underestimated. The existing open fields provide an appropriate precursor to a stunning black and white village. Secondly, there exists a history of serious flooding in Odesan. The local residents have adopted ways and means of trying to mitigate flood damage by their properties. Um, a new development would utilize a much needed natural soak away. The proposed site is raised from the road and has the serious potential of becoming surrounded by flood water. I fear the application site could almost become an island in flood water. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. And thank you to the officers for their um input for the um the outline of the application and the views they have about this. Um so just I would start in fact with the concern about the addition to the nutrient problems we've got in the river. It just does seem to be enormously important. And if there are any concerns about it, that should give us pause, uh, and certainly does in this case. Uh, we've heard a great deal about flooding, I won't go on about that, I know the area, and it does flood very badly, so you know, it's important that we take note of that. Um, the, uh, the, the layout is very odd, I mean, we, we, we've heard that the, that the um, you know, whole idea of development there is going to compromise the village, um, you know, the village is a great area, and the character of the village, and the layout sort of towards the back seems very strange, not only in terms of visibility, if they were going to do anything absolutely in keeping to at least along the front, but also actually orientation would minimize the um, possibility of so the game and things of that sort as well. So I think that was very bad move and I don't entirely understand it. Um, we've heard about the heritage setting and I commented on that, very important indeed, particularly important and special village um, that we need to bear in mind and we don't want to compromise that. Um, and then the final point, I think, from what I wanted to say was, was about pedestrian safety. This development would be cut off from the village in effect um, because there's no uh, walkway. Uh, we heard about speed and I'm certainly aware of that. Uh, if the place, if, if we do get serious flooding, that would isolate them as we've heard. And of course, the building itself would reduce the absorption value of that particular field and add probably to the flood problems that are there already. So I really can't see anything positive about this application and a great many negatives that I think lead us to um, want to refuse this. Councillor Davis. <clears throat> I will support the officer on this one, uh, but I would like to say that I did, uh, I do like the design of the houses. It's just a pity that it's in the wrong location. And if we were looking for a wetland, I think the entrance to this proposed site <laughs> would be just right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Councillor Mill. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, <clears throat> there is something slightly engaging about the, the faux vernacular, the sort of um, copy book cutesy of the houses. I, I, I grant you that. I, I was actually uh, reflecting on yesterday's site meeting, always very useful exercises, the site meetings, and I asked two questions actually of uh, agenda item six, but they're the same questions I have in mind now, and, and they were, what is the like, agricultural land classification and what is the housing density? Uh, the, well, actually, I didn't ask them for this one because I thought, actually, I'm probably perfectly well able to look myself. Well, the agricultural land classification, again, is great too. So it's best and most, most versatile. So therefore, it's contra 
uh, NPAPF uh, 174, um, to uh, mitigate, to provide sufficient uh, public benefit uh, to a development like this to to um, to overwhelm that that that. Uh, that objection. Uh, you, 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 uh, one of the things you've got to do is to demonstrate that you're providing sufficient housing. Now, uh, for agenda item six, we were looking at densities of around between 20 30 per hectare. Here, the density is nine per hectare, which is so low. I do recognize that under uh, policy RA, uh, SS2 rather, which uh, um, which specifies that uh, we have a target uh, a net density across the county between 30 and 50 he uh, dwellings per hectare that we may, um, that there may be less in, less in in more sensitive areas. I do recognize this is clearly a more sensitive area, but but but, but surely but there comes a point when we need to make a decision as to whether uh, our recognition of the sensitivity of the area is overwhelmed by the compromise to uh, policy uh, MPPF 174, developing that best and most fertile, fertile land. And I, I, I have to say that um, it does, it, it does, it, it, it takes neither box for me. I'm, uh, I'm afraid I'm going to support Bob's recommendation uh, for all the reasons that he's already enunciated. But these two additional reasons that I have in mind, that it's in MPPF 174. And uh, and SS two in respect of housing density. So th okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Say? Have I missed any other uh, anyone else who has been speaking? If not, um, the local member. I don't think we've no, no, no. right, right, right sort of, no. but uh, very straightforward. Um, can I just go to the option? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I think members have uh, had a pretty thorough debate as far as the application is concerned. Um, I don't particularly want to uh, add anything to add to the, the debate we've had. As far as Councillor Milne's couple of points are concerned, um, move the recommendation um, as it's set out in the officer's report. So um, I suspect that if Councillor Bowen wanted to amend his uh, recommendation, then he would need to do that to include those two matters. I would say I'm a bit cautious, particularly about the issue of housing density, because if we are basically saying we think it should be a, a more dense development, then arguably the impact on the, the setting of the heritage asset would be greater. So I'm very reluctant about that. Um, you're right about the sensitivity of. Uh, if we had all afternoon, site. we could debate that one. That would be an interesting debate. Well, we could be there all afternoon. Um, so I'm I'm very very reluctant about that, and I would suggest that we stick with the, the reasons for refusal that we have. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I would be happy to stick with the refusals as we. Yeah. Can I say that the, with, with that respect to Council of course, yes, expertise. The alternative uh, footpath has been outlined the fact that it isn't in the ownership, but the alternative footpath, which has been offered to us within the report, uh, leaves it about four, three to four times the depth that the existing path. I think it would be very, even if it was possible, no one would take that particularly. They would take the dangerous route. <laughs> And you take the dangerous route to live, uh, I think that is irrelevant. Anyway, sorry. That's it. Right, we have a proposal, proposal and, and seconded by proposed by Councillor Bowen, seconded by Councillor Foxton. Can I ask those in favour, please? One, two, three, four, I think that is unanimous, so I, I don't think I need to call for abstention to votes against. Can I thank you all for your attendance? Can I um, ask that the live stream is uh, finished? The live stream has been finished, Dr. Chairman. Thank you.